listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. We're back in the booth at the bomb hole presented by Wild Mike's Pizza, Pub Beer, and Solomon. Now, to my left, we have Mr. Jed Anderson in the booth. Jed, what's happening? Chilling. How you doing? Not too bad. Uh, I know you've been wanting to uh, kind of intro Buds. We've been Stony hanging. Buds, how are we doing? <laughs> so good, my dog. Love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you got it dialed. We've, uh, so I've been spending some time with Jed. We just went on a little backcountry trip here in uh, Utah, and he just kept saying... Uh, Stony Buds, how are we doing? <laughs> we are back at the bomb hole. Stony Buds, how are you doing? We are back. We are back at the bomb hole. <laughs> so, uh, Latex, let's talk about uh, what just happened on this on this trip. Uh, I know your cheeks took a kind of a beating, you could say. Cheeks got clapped, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm just out here in Utah and in Idaho um, doing a backcountry trip, the first one in a pretty long time with uh, Nick Baden. Jared Elston, Tommy came out for a bit, you came out for a bit, but yeah, just trying to like figure that shit out again and learn the ropes again, and yeah, it's just gnarly, but yeah, basically I just landed on a tree on a jump and kind of clapped the cheeks. And what else? What do you mean what else? You hit the cheeks and another part of your body oh, also the taint, injured. the gooch, the taint got murked. <laughs> yeah, the taint yeah. got murked. I was, it's scary, it, it's a mad bruised and uh, went to the clinic yesterday. Everything's in working order. So, I And mean, then you basically had to show the nurse your your uh, your butt cheeks, right? And a little more, yeah. But I was kind of tripping before I went in. I don't know. It's always, like, uncomfortable, that, like, idea, like, oh, I'm just about to have to, like, get naked and show this random person this area that's pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> The worst is when they try to fondle your nuts, man. That's always uncomfortable. She fondled a bit. She did. Yeah, did she bit. Make always you, uncomfortable. I don't know if women know this. Shrinkage. When they, but you, when you, uh, they, you get a physical, they feel your ball sack and then they make you cough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did she make you? Did she make you cough? No, nothing like that. It was just like it's just in an area that's not hard to get or not easy to get to. Sorry. Um, but no, it was chill. I mean, they see crazy so, shit. So what's going on? Everything all good in that department? Should I show? Well, I mean, yeah. not, the, not the gooch, but the ass cheek. Oh, it's yeah. like a pretty, yeah, yeah show the bruise. It's a pretty, bruise. like, yeah, good, see uh, the bruise. Uh, where do I point this thing? Uh, you can point it at the camera that faces you there. Um, he's about to, uh, for the listeners, he's, he's big, got a very big, big burgundy butt cheek. Yes, he's got a black and blue butt cheek. <laughs> and that's what we call paying the cost to be the boss. That looks painful, dude. Yeah. I, it was just like, I don't know, I don't, I've never been injured in there, so it's just like, I don't know, I was reading all this sketchy stuff. I think like Windsor James, like, broke his urethra or something, like in his, Oof. like, sacking his board or something, so I was just like trying to read shit about it, and I was like, oh my god, this could be pretty bad, but luckily I think it's all, all good. And I've heard of people having to get them drained. Yeah, when they get too bad, drain taint, drain the no drain the <laughs> oh. drain the blood because it pools up and gets all stagnant in there. Yeah, sketchy. Okay, well uh, now that we we covered the we had a little taint talk. I think we taint should talk. throw it back to uh, the Cal Calgary roots. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's give a shout out to your mom Beth. Yeah, let's give a shout out to the whole family, the whole Anderson squad. Jared, your dad. Uh, you got a little nephew. I have a nephew and a niece. Oliver is the nephew, and my niece, Indy. Uncle Latex, is that Uncle what they Latex, yeah. Uncle Jed, <laughs> best job ever. Yeah, you were, pretty ta- awesome. you were describing uh, unclehood, mm-hmm. and you had you had it pretty well de- uh, depicted. I mean, it's probably the same for every uncle, right? It's just like, come kick it, bring them like treats and gifts, and then when they start to get too crazy, you're just like, yo... I'm out. Yeah, just nice give them back, you guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you get to be super cool to them, and yeah. That, I mean, yeah. I just want to. That's I just want to be that like movie style uncle where they're like, Uncle Jed is sick. Like, exactly. I want to kick it with Uncle Jed. <laughs> like, and he once they're ha- too he much, have any rules. hand them over. <laughs> yeah. So, going growing up in Calgary, uh, a lot of people don't know. You know, you grew up doing contests, and your mom has this organization called Riders on Board, mm-hmm. which kicks ass. Um, yeah, 
So you kind of grew up in this whole snowboard family, basically, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like, my brother and I started snowboarding when we were, he's five years older than me. I think I started when I was five or six, so he was around 10 years old. He started a little bit before me, started doing lessons, and obviously, just being the younger brother, I just wanted to imitate him. Started snowboarding as well. It's pretty new for the whole family, but we got into it pretty quick and, like, started doing contests and... There was, like, snowboard clubs and stuff at that time, but there wasn't really anything that I think my parents really, like, fit what we were, what they saw for us and, like, kind of, like, how we were as kids. So, yeah, they started Riders on Board, which is basically a snowboard club. Um, It's, like, a program. And, yeah, they've been going, I think, over 20 years now. I think it's, like, one of the, I think it's the longest-running snowboard club in Canada. But it's pretty cool. It's, like, not a traditional... I mean... It's traditional in the sense where, like, there is, like, coaching aspect and everything like that, but it's more of a, like, curating, uh, I don't know how to say it really, but just curating, like, a, what is the word I'm looking for? It's an environment that's... Exactly, curating an environment that's fun and safe, and you get to meet other kids that are into the same shit and that are passionate about snowboarding, and it's not so much of, uh, you know, a lot of parents get involved, and they're very olympic focused or x games focused and it's not so much about that it's more about trying to create a fun environment and a safe environment where i don't know for me and you and a lot of our friends snowboarding and skateboarding was such an escape from whatever it's just like we didn't necessarily want to have those coaches and those people telling us what to do where with riders on board i feel like it's more of a just like a safe space for people to come and chill and like have the opportunity to still do the contests and go to the mountains, have the ride to get to the mountains mm-hmm. and have those like older people that the parents can have trust in. And yeah, it's pretty the, awesome. The, the good example, by the way, uh, spoke with Beth this morning. Oh, she, no way. She's in Costa Rica. <laughs> it was like a weird ring, you know, in the sound, it makes a weird yeah, yeah, sound yeah. when you call somebody and she's like, Hey Chris, I'm driving through the jungle in Costa Rica right now. Yeah, and we caught up forever. But the, a good example to me of why Riders on Board is really cool is like if you were to take uh, a standard issue snowboard school or program, it's like you said, Olympic focused. It's usually built around like ski racers, and you got to do like box jumps and all this like weird corny shit. But like for example, Riders on Board, you guys have a skate park with like graffiti walls, and mm-hmm. it's like more of a space for for mentorship as opposed to like like parents that just want their son to have an Olympic medal at all costs, you know? And yeah, I think unfortunately a lot of times with um, sports that involve a lot of money, like snowboarding is up there as well as hockey and things. It's a lot of times at the field, it's like the parents dream rather than the kids. A lot of the time it's like, they want that credential of like, Oh, my kids went to the Olympics or like my kids doing this shit, even if, and like maybe the kid's not even enjoying it, which I think is pretty whack. So I think just to have a space where to just let the kid like go and be with his friends and like, yeah, if they want to do that contest thing, like that's cool. If they want to film, like, like I came out of that, I I was in that program for a bit, like riders on board. And then Kennedy was in the riders on board, Kennedy Deck. JJ and Finn. Like there's a lot of cool kids that have come out of it. And like, yeah, none of us are obviously in the Olympics or X games, but that's still there if you want to do it. It's more so just a place to grow and kind of have like that that freedom rather than I don't know, yeah. Sometimes I just feel parents get really involved and just want to like I don't know, control shit. Dude, you you see it all the time in all sports, but like yeah. the you know, the it's it's what it is, is like the child becomes a uh, extension of the parents' ego. Like they get to you know, live the glory days that they never made it and their kid. Mm. And it's like the kid, they burn out or they don't like it or they're not doing it for themselves. Uh, but the thing that I find to be really cool is like, you, you're like a street snowboarder, right? The Jeds, you're, you know, put you in that category. But you're, you know, Kuzik described it as classically trained. Like you grew up riding for Burton. Let's talk about phase one of Jed. It's like you grew up riding for Burton and doing contests. And you had a big old, I remember when I met you, you wore a helmet that in big, bold letters that said J-E-D across the helmet. Yeah, it was pretty fresh. It was like <laughs> some like airbrush artist, some local airbrush artist just like hooked it up. Uh, he did like hockey goalie helmets and stuff. I don't know. It was pretty dope. So swag. Yeah, it was pretty pretty fresh. I but didn't even know you rode for Burton. That's, that's yeah, it. when I was really young. So I think 
I don't know. My memory is bad with this stuff, but when I was pretty young, I got on this shop called The Source in, from Calgary, which, like, give an air horn to, like, Mark and Dave because they definitely helped me out as a young kid. And I'm not sure what, how exactly it happened, but I got, I think I got on, like, Rep Burton, like, as, like, a little, like, P13, it was called. There was, like, this young group of kids, and it was, like, me, Luke Matroni, Mikel Bang. I, there was some other, like, I think Jack was probably a part of it. So, like, all these kids, and, like, I went to Vermont when I was pretty young. So, yeah, I was doing, like, contests, like, would do go to the U.S. Open and stuff. And also, yeah, uh, thanks to my mom for, like, bringing me to the States and realizing that's important at that time. But I'm kind of trailing all over the place here. But, uh, oh, you're doing great. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, when I was young, I was just doing a lot of contests. And I didn't even know filming was, like, a thing. And it kind of wasn't at that point. Like, at least for younger people, for sure it wasn't, like... I don't even know what videos would have been out around that time, but the whole video thing wasn't really as accessible as a career path, especially as a person who's young. It was more so you did the contest and like that's how you became a professional snowboarder. Well, I think it's way more important to get good when you're young and just fucking just get good. It's so much easier to learn tricks and progress when you're five than it is when you're 35. No fear. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Back in the day, and when you were a kid, you were, like, flipping off of everything. I talked to Jared, your brother, briefly, and he's like, he's like, Jed used to just do flips all the time on everything. He said that uh, you had a brief stint uh, blading as well. Yeah, for sure. Like, before skating or snowboarding, I think I was blading. Respect. <laughs> yeah, I was just fucking, I love BMXing. I love rollerblading. I love mountain biking. I loved, like, the playground at lunch. Like, I was just, like, we'd, like, build up this like huge pile of gravel next to the monkey bars and just like spin off the monkey bars, like into the pile of gravel. I just like, I think I was just a kid who had a lot of energy and I just like love fucking around and like just trying to get crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Just doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, one story I was, I was kind of talking to Beth trying to uh, pry some stuff out of her. I'm like, <laughs> how can I throw Jed under the bus? And, uh, she told a story about how when you were young, you used to go to all these contests and you snowboarded so long, you actually didn't, you actually shit your pants. Oh yeah. I remember this so vividly. <laughs> you just it, didn't want to go in. <laughs> it was at Sunshine Village, this resort in Alberta. Um, I don't know how old I would have been, but yeah, I was just snowboarding and snowboarding and I don't know. Obviously when you're younger, you're timing, you like, can't really be like, oh, like I should probably shit. Like, <laughs> It was, like, a good learning experience, mm -hmm. you know? Like, okay, so now I know this is my threshold. Like, But I remember, yeah, I, uh, I shit my pants, for sure. <laughs> I was, like, eight or something. <laughs> so whack, too. Like, long johns, snow pants, snowboard boots. Like, bro, my mom it's a mess. fucking had to help me out with that, for sure. Shout out to all those moms that deal with all that and yeah, dads. Yeah, for sure. Um, so then, yeah, around that time, you're then you switched over to Forum, mm -hmm. and you cruise around the Forum, guys. But... Um, to kind of like jump forward, it seemed like the 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 early days of you know we'll call bobblehead Jed is phase one. Okay. Um, the young bobblehead, and you're doing flips everywhere. And then at what point were you like, you know, it's start starting to be more drawn to the video stuff? Well, yeah. So I got on form, and like I said, I don't even know how this happened. Really, I think what was his name? You're on the Young Blood program. I like, was I was on Burton, and then there's a. Uh, I think his name's Dan McNamara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, I think, went, f or his wife worked for Burton, Yolanda, I believe her name was. And uh, I think he was going to work for Genius or Startup Genius. And so he kind of brought a couple of us over to the form program. So, yeah, I was on that for a couple of years and I was like, yo, form is so sick. Like, I had seen The Resistance, I think was, I think it was, this was even pre-True Life or maybe around True Lifetime, but... Yeah, so I was still pretty young. Like, I think I was, like, 11, 12, 13, around there. But basically what happened is I still didn't know the video thing was, like, a route to take. And I was on form at the time. And I kind of that age where I'm starting to think about how I'm dressing and how I'm looking a little bit. And not just, like, because when you're younger, it's just, like, your parents are, like, we're going snowboarding. And it's, like, I don't fucking think about, like, anything. I'm just, like, those are my snow. Like, I'm just, like, going. And then you start to have that you start to click things together like, oh, people like look different and snowboard different and like, oh, this dude's cool for this reason. This cool dude's cool for that reason. And around, all around the same time, I remember I got, or the videos I was watching a lot was Love, Hate and Moment of Truth. 
and those two videos I would just watch so much and lame as well uh and I was just blown away I was like this is like what I want to do like you see so much personality and I was like oh my god like all that introduced me to so much music and I was just like how do I do that and at that time I was on Foreman Special Blend and they were sending me like boxes of crazy gear looking back at now I'm like oh this gear is like kind of like for the, it's like a time capsule piece you know like crazy special blend gear but for me at that time I was watching love hate or something I'm like I don't want to fucking wear this shit like this sucks like I want to look like Daryl or Hebel or like Matty Ryan or something you know so it was just kind of like got to a point where I was made that kind of had to make that decision I think a contract was up they didn't want I remember a huge part of it too they didn't want my mom to travel with me anymore they didn't want a chaperone traveling with me anymore I think I was only like 13 so I think that was also like my parents were like eh, like I don't know if that's such a good idea. This is like the era of Bozong and everyone's like going pretty hard. I mean, that shit kind of flew over my head at the time, but looking back and like, I'm like, yeah, they'd made the right decision with that. Like I, if I had a 13 year old, I probably wouldn't let them go either. Send them out with Bozong 13 year old. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, <clears throat> like huge, like I'm super thankful for my parents for like, kind of like holding their foot down with that. Cause to me, I was like, it was a super hard decision for me. Cause I had to say no to this contract or whatever, which no, me, it meant no boxes showing up anymore. What kind of bisque we talking at age 12? Dude, I knew you were going to ask this shit, and I, like, I fucking don't know. Because, like, <laughs> my parents were just, like, helping But there me. was money. There was money. Yeah. There was money, so for sure. At what age have you been, like, getting paid to snowboard? That's an interesting question. Dude, probably mad young. Like, I think, I mean, there's been different periods, but, uh, like, I think I was getting, yeah, I got, like, a contract when I was, like, 11 or something, you know? <laughs> Holy shit. And the thing that's crazy about conventional wow. sports, like like LeBron contractually, if you're if you're going to school, you can't be paid. That's true. For huh? like basketball or football. So that's one thing about snowboarding is like you can you can start getting paid at eleven or motocross, you know, certain sports like that you can. But anyway, so not to but derail. Like, for like I didn't even I didn't think about money at all. Like I didn't even like take that in it was more so about like getting like I'm like, Oh, I'm not gonna get any like snowboards that show up because like, like when that shit happens when you're that young Still, even when that shit happens, I'm like, fuck yeah. But it's like Christmas as a kid, for sure. A forum box when a you're 11? Bo- Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. I mean, it still feels great to get a box. Oh, at, it feels amazing. Age, and right? I you're appreciate like, it Sweet. still. But like, <laughs> at that age, it's like, I knew that saying no to this or like that that's ending, that that meant that the boxes were ending. I'm not going to go travel on these trips. I'm not going to like do all this shit. But it was definitely the right decision. So once I kind of accepted that, that that part was over, it was like, oh, I can just do whatever I want now. Like, I can wear whatever I want. I can kind of try to figure out who I am or how I want my snowboarding to look, which I've definitely had a lot of phases. Um, But to have that freedom at that age was really important, I think. Um, Just to be able to, like, try to... It's so fucking young. Like, you have to have that age to emulate, like, your heroes. And, like, when you have a contract saying, this is your outfit, this is what you have to wear, it's, like, really... I don't know. I think it's kind of fucked up. True. It also, you know, to every other kid in the world, if your forum at that time is the elite brand. Mm-hmm. And so if, you, if you're walking away from a contract from like one of the dopest, if not the dopest brand at that time to go wear what you want, it's like, I feel like most other people would cling on for dear life for that contract. Was it go. your decision or your mom's decision to, that you couldn't do it because of the age thing and the chaperone? I think it was both of our decision. Both. Like she expressed to me that she wasn't comfortable with or both my parents expressed the like, and I'm sure it's something that, I think it was something that we could have worked out. But it was also, I remember them explaining to me, because I was complaining a lot, because like some crazy gear would show up and I'd be like, I don't want to wear this. And like, they explained to me like, you signed a contract, like this is something that is a part of it if you want to mm-hmm. do this. And at that age, I think we all just kind of knew like, this is kind of just like, dumb. Like, yeah, you're so just, young. Like, snowboarding is going to be there like i'm going to continue to snowboard like there's so much time like i don't need to be treating it as a job so early and forced into wearing something and i was getting pretty over like contests at that time too so it was just time for me to like figure some shit out that's cool dude. one thing that's really fascinating about this time too um is that i mean we started filming 
I don't know, you're probably 17 when we started hanging out a lot. 15, or you're, 16, 15 or 16. Yeah, so yeah. we, but ever since that time from when I've met you until mid 20s, it seemed like you never drank, or, you know, you're around all this partying all the time. And two parts to this question is like, A, why did you not drink and get fucked up? And B, it almost, how did you act like you were fucked up? Like you would, you would party harder than people that were fucked up. He's like party sober guy. I think I was just, I had a group of friends and we were all kind of on that tip of like not drinking, but I think I was really scared to lose what I had. Um, and growing into a teenager, it's like, I saw, I'm not going to name names, but I saw a lot of people I looked up to kind of blow it. And I was, I mean, my parents definitely talked to me about it a bit and like, you have like an opportunity here and like, there's a lot of kids that wish they had this opportunity to like do the things that you're doing and they're waiting for you, your downfall pretty much. So I think I was just like, I really wanted to have a, a good foundation and I, I wanted to like be able to be myself without that as well. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think about it a lot. Like, I don't know if it was like the right or wrong decision, but um, I think it helped me stay focused on what was important at that time. It, it's uh, interesting because I think about the other person that did that. That was a big inspiration to me. I remember being at a party, being super fucked up. I may have talked about this on the air. Sorry if I'm repeating myself. But um, I was at a party with Pat Moore. You know, he's a form young blood, and I was shit-faced. I was probably like 17 or I don't know how old I was. But he was the same age as me, roughly. He's like a year older. And he was on like in the forum video and vi video games doing cab nine noses, and he's at a party sober. And I'm sitting there cross-eyed, and uh, <laughs> it just was interesting. Like, hey, you see a lot of younger people that have done really, really well when they're when they're at that 18 year old. They they start getting these opportunities, to, like fucking do something with it, don't blow it. Because a lot of people blow it, for sure. And don't get me wrong, like I had, I started drinking and doing that stuff like later on, but and I think that was important to do as well. I think it's just knowing the timing and like seizing the opportunities that you have, and like maybe being like okay, this isn't the time to party or, like, experiment with this shit. And I don't know, like, I think it's good that I, like, got fucked up and, like, puked and, like, you have those experiences. If you don't, if you don't, that's super sick too, but it's, like, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm just a curious person and, like, I want to experience shit too. So it's just, like, I just knew at that time it was, like, such, I was so ripe and, like, so new in snowboarding and, like, I didn't have any sort of like legacy. I didn't have a video. I didn't even have a video part yet. I was like, that's all I cared about. I was just like, I just want to film like some video parts. I don't give a shit about like partying or drinking. Well, this is a good segue for our guest question, which is presented by Solomon. The first guest question is from video grass owner champion and a grade human, Justin Meyer. What's up bomb hole. East stone Grenier. How you guys doing? Jed, glad you're on the show. I wanted to hear from you how it was as a little kid traveling from Calgary to Big Bear to stay with some random people you'd never met to film a web video. And shout outs to Beth for letting her son go to another country to chase his dreams. Anyways, tell us how it went from there and uh, I think that's a cool story. You're the shit. Later, dude. <laughs> love Meyer I owe a lot to Meyer so what happened on that trip flying out with random people from Calgary to Bear well it wasn't necessarily random people because um, I was going to stay with Johnny Miller who I knew from being on Air Blaster at the time and during th that era like I you remember Sunday in the park was like a huge thing it's not how it is now where there's so much content coming out it was like once a week there was this really sick park edit of new people that maybe you hadn't heard of that are really talented and kind of was an opportunity to showcase, I don't know, new, new people. And I really wanted just to, I didn't even care about Sunday in the park, but I just really wanted to go and ride bear because at that time it was like, there was nowhere else that looked like it. It was just, I heard my, I heard from other people like, it's just a skate park basically from top to bottom it's just rails everywhere there's jumps everywhere the entire run is a snowboard park uh, that sounds so fun it sounds crazy and i knew that johnny lived there so i hit him up and i was like can i come stay with you for a week or two 
and just ride bear. I didn't know that Meyer lived with Johnny, who made Sunday in the parks. And he wasn't there for, like, the first week I was there, so I was just riding with Johnny. And then he got back. I kind of like started putting it together, obviously. Or he, Johnny said to me when we were there, I was like, oh, yeah, like, my roommate, Meyer, like, does Sunday in the park. And I remember, like, be, staying in a room, like, right by where he edited it. Edited it? <laughs> How am I saying? <laughs> where he edited the videos. And I saw all the titles, like, hand-drawn. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, I recognize, like, what's going on here. And it's, like, mad, like, fool's names written out in Meyer's way. So when he came back, he asked me if I wanted to go film for a Sunday in the Park. And I was just like, yes, let's get it. Like... <laughs> This is so sick. Like, this is... I'm going to be on one of these edits. Like, this is going to be so fresh. And That was kind of phase two of Jed because that was the beginning of phase two of Jed because at that point, I think you were riding roam boards mm -hmm. and you were wearing tight pants. You know, you come from special blend Skittle fucking outfit. Yeah. To, and uh, it seemed like it was just like, all right, I'm going to unload and just beat this park down, which is how I remember watching that Sunday in the Park edit. Yeah, and I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit because between there's a bit of a story between the special blend and that park edit. Like, I'm watching those videos, Love Hate, Moment of Truth, Burning Bridges, like One Love. Like, I watched Tech Nine videos a lot, and I watched the, the Robot Food videos a lot, and I watched the Kids Know videos a lot. Like, those are what I'd go through. And I have a friend, Graham Foy. We should probably air horn. I remember him from back in the day. <laughs> yeah. He started filming, and he snowboarded as well, but he started making little videos, and I was like, oh, I want to film with Graham. Like, I want to film a part with Graham. So I would just go to COP all the time, try to learn tricks. I lived on a hill with a park across the street from my house, so I got a rail built, and I would just go learn tricks and try to film stuff, and I got on Air Blaster, and that's kind of how the Johnny Miller connection happened. Got it. Air Blaster, Johnny Miller. And the tight pants, roam, all that shit. Like, I was just like trying to figure out what I was rocking with. And you guys were the cheese dicks at that point. I remember you guys writing that on everything. Yeah, yeah. We had a, me and, that was me, the crew, cheese dick? Yeah, me, <laughs> me and Graham and some of our friends uh, had a crew called cheese dicks, and we were just like, yeah, fucking around. Like, I don't know. I was watching, like, also a huge influence was, like, Baker 3 and, like, Pigwood Slaughterhouse. Like, I was just watching, like, Baca and, like, all these, like, I was really relating with, like, the Hesh dudes at that point. And I was just like, damn, like, this shit is really sick. And I was, like, bobbleheading around with, like, hella tight pants. And, like, <laughs> just, but I, I really, like, starting to focus on what tricks were happening and staying up to date with, like, the what you needed to do to be a rail snowboarder and just trying, striving to, like, be that pinnacle. And I was, like, really, like, obsessed with that. And so, yeah, when I went to Bear and got the opportunity to film for Sunday in the Park, I was like, I have to snap. Like, I need to go, like, in. And that was your which, chance to really shine yeah. and have relevant tricks. And It felt like the, like my first time where I'm like, a bunch of people are going to see this. So yeah, I remember watching it and being like, who the fuck is this kid? I remember seeing him as a little bobblehead at the U.S. Open. Next time I see him, he's just, like, doing all the new tricks that nobody's done you know we were it, that had a profound effect on snowboarding because those those old like sunday in the parks would get like hundreds of thousands of views everybody comment watched section them. was yeah. going like off yeah. it wasn't there's nothing like that anymore but it was just so much diluted content now buds i think yeah. it might be time to uh hit that thing that pays the bills real quick let's do it let's get into our breakout moment presented by our friends over at 10 barrel and pub beer Pub Beer supports us. You should support them. Their tagline is cheap, fun beer. Now, Jed, before snowboarding became a big, serious career, back when it was cheap and fun, do you have a memorable breakout moment? Yeah, this story that I was just talking about pretty much ties into that breakout moment. So from that Sunday in the park, I think it, yeah, they, those came out on Sunday. They'd usually film for it for the week, and it came out on Sunday. And, uh... It was they're filming these days at the time. Joe Carlino was filming these days. Joe and Justin Meyer were friends. And Nick Dirks was also filming for these days, who was also on Air Blaster. So all this stuff kind of just tied in together. Like I had known Nick a little bit. Joe knew Justin. The Sunday in the park came out. And they needed someone else to come on a trip to Quebec. And 
Joe hit up Justin and was like, yo, who, like, what's up with this kid? Like, Nick says he knows him. Would he want to come up to Quebec and try to film some clips for the new Transworld video? And Justin told me that, and I was like, dude, it almost makes me emotional. I was, like, <laughs> tripping. I was like, this is, like, all I want to do. Like, and... Yeah, that's like definitely the breakout moment because I got, I went to go there and it was like the Sunday in the Park mentality again. I was like, I'm gonna fucking like, I want to like get like good ass clips, and like, I don't want to like blow this. Like I want to like, and dude, that trip was crazy. Show up, it's Jonas Mitchellot. I don't know how to. I still don't know how to say his name. That sounds after right. All these that's, years. that's about right. Jared Hardy, Nick Dirks, Joe Carlino, um, and Luif. And Luif, like, no one really knew about Luif yet either. But I had seen Bandwagon that previous year, I think it was. So I know who I knew who Luif was, was, and I knew who Laurent was, who I knew as LNP. And I was around all these people, and I was like, I can't even explain it. It was like... Yeah, it's all you wanted, right? Yeah. You're 15? I think I was like, yeah, 15, 14 or 15. Yeah, this is your big, big chance. Dude, it was crazy. And I, I remember fanning out on Laurent so crazy and him getting all weirded out because, like... <laughs> We met up with him. Dude, I remember it so clearly. We were we went to get Subway, and we met Laurent there, and I was just like, oh, my God, like that's Laurent. And I was, like, checking his gear, and I was like, yo, those are the pants, like, from his video part. And I, and I think that was, like, the first thing I said to him. I was like, yo, like, you wore those, like, in, I think it was, like, in bandwagon or whatever, and he was just like, what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was what's tripping. His, he what's was his, stoked, I'm What's sure. his kid's fucking deal, man? <laughs> no, I was tripping. I don't know if this, like, even comes across, like... No, it does. It's really yeah, cool to no, hear. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. And and when you showed up, I, like, the thing for me that was memorable is you got to the down flat ledge in Quebec City and tri- basically did some shit that I'd never seen anybody do in the streets mm. and just snapped. Like, he just beat everything down in sight, right, when you got there? Tried to. I was just trying. I didn't... I'd only filmed with Graham at that point. But I was, I knew that, like, like my first skateboard video was a trans world video. Like, I knew trans world video, trans world was, like, a big deal. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, this is, like, a real, if I want to do this, like, this is the time to, like, really try to do it. People are going to see it. It's yeah. trans world. Time to show up. Yeah. Yeah. If and there was ever up. a time, this is the time. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, yeah, that's, like, the breakout. And then, for me. you know, let's just keep it moving on this trajectory, because this time, this is where our paths kind of cross. Is mm-hmm. that you? You filmed this these days. It was like a half part, mm-hmm. right? And and it was fucking banger. We'll probably cue the clips up on the screen as we're talking about this stuff. And then um, after that was the following year was get real. Yeah. And uh, I think right before that, you and I both got signed to Solomon. Mm-hmm. Shouts to Hav. Big and, shout out to Hav. And uh, yeah, what was? How did that whole thing? kind of come come along for you getting signed to Solomon getting asked to do Transworld video and all that well I think at that time with the Transworld snower videos what they would do is kind of whoever had guest clips in the previous video they'd kind sometimes kind of bring them on to the crew the next year so Joe after that trip I think that coming summer or fall he's like is this something you want to do would you want to like try to film a full part for the next video can you say it in his voice how he'd actually say it <laughs> I can he'd be like ha. Ah. <laughs> Jad, let's get you in the vet next year. <laughs> More like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and yeah, so, and at that point, like that video came out. So I once again had sponsors kind of contacting me or companies contacting me, being like, and it had been a few years since that had happened. So I had a few different options at the time. And after hanging out with like Lewif, and I had met, I think I met Chris at Hood, mm-hmm. and he was doing Solomon, and I met Hava. And I was, I was talking to, I think, a Rome, Capita, and Solomon. And Solomon wasn't that dope at the time. Like It was a rebuild. It yeah, was a Hava rebuild. kind of built that Rebuild situation. Up. It was still pretty, like, blah. And, like, but it, 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 I, it was also a good opportunity. Like, I could, I could kind of see what they were doing. And I was like, Chris is dope. Luif is dope. Like, I'm going to get to have a say in things. And it just seemed like a cool opportunity to be a part of something new rather than to join things that are already really cool at that time. So yeah, that's kind of, so my experience hopping on this thing with Jed was, this was my first major film too. Mm. And we were both two hungry, hungry hippos. Jed was a few years younger than me at the time. And I remember like, this is such a trip because 
you know, we, we go on our first trip. Dude, I remember, like, now that I'm, it's all coming back, thinking about it, it's kind of fun. But, like, November, it, we went on, before Thanksgiving, I had a handful of clips. I think you were sitting on, like, 12 clips before Thanksgiving or some shit. Or, like... Yeah, we went, I remember we went to Ohio and we went to upstate New York. But one thing that was so notable for, for me is I had never seen anybody, still to this day, I think there's nobody that would argue me on this, that you get more tricks per trip than anybody I've ever seen s- still or I've ever snowboarded with. Like, if you, an average film trip, for a lot of people listening, they don't necessarily understand what a snowboard film trip entails. And it's like, you show up to a new city, you're there for, like, let's say two weeks, and, you know, the average person, you know, probably gets five. Yeah, I was going to say four or five. And, you know, Jed oftentimes is leaving with usually more like 12 or something like that, on an, on an especially drop and ramp down bar days, you know. Yeah, and, those days for sure. And I remember you're, it was just unbelievable the stack you had that year. And yeah, like you said, it was drop and ramp down bar years. So it was it was diff- It was a different game at that point. It was you could go to a down bar and do five tricks, and that's five clips. You know, it's not now where I'm more selective of what it is that I'm hitting or what tricks that I'm doing. So it was definitely easier to stack at that point, and the expectation and the level of riding was completely different. But I think, yeah, it was just, we were both horny. <laughs> we were just both <laughs> mad horny to get clips. So, like, and we both knew. We both knew that it was a crazy opportunity. And we didn't want to, like, we wanted to seize the moment and I get remember, it. I remember, like, uh, Latex was, like, putting on for his fucking city out there. And I was like, <laughs> I need to, I need to, like, Made level, you step I need up. to level up so I don't look like a fucking idiot next to this guy. <laughs> but that was, there were so many fun trips. Um Calgary I remember like dude and dude mind you Jed is still such a punk kid at this point how old are you think 17 or 16 I think I was like 15 yeah 16 16 16 he I remember you were like drawing um like you had a notebook you've always been a doodler which we can maybe talk about later but I remember you had you just got like this Volvo and we would just be driving down the streets like running over all the trash cans in Calgary like (laughs) trash exploding breaking the side view mirror we had Robbie (laughs) Cell on this one trip poor like like Jed tortured Robbie Cell like at one point we were in this like this fucking he like we were fucking with him and he was just doing donuts in the snow around Robbie's cell forever like (laughs) driving around him in circles or something I think he just sat down and gave up (laughs) He was stuck in the center. I think it was one of those, like, (laughs) one of those things where he was trying to, he went, walked up to try to get in the car, and I just started doing circles around him slowly, and then I started going around him real fast, and then he just sat down so bummed. Yeah, we're just obviously in the car dying. I don't know, pretty pretty whack move, but pretty funny. He pulled the classic move, like, right when you try to go get in the door, he takes off. Yeah, and then just kept (laughs) circling. That's awesome. Yeah, having a car, too, that was... So crazy. Let's probably throw Robbie a little air, air horn. Yeah, let's throw him an air horn. He actually got some amazing photos on that trip. Um, So, you know, we have so much shit to cover, but I, I know. W- one thing that to keep it moving is that you have, if you think about, so you ended up getting last part and get real. And then you, the next video is shoot, or I think it's Bon Voyage last part, and then shoot the moon last part. Basically, like that coming on the scene, dude, you just blew the fucking doors. Let off me, the scene. Let me do a quick Patreon question about what you're talking okay, about. Okay, let's hit it. Um, your part in Shoot the Moon, this is from Rob Z, by the way. Your uh, part Rob in Z. Shoot the Moon is timeless. How long were you stacking clips, and what made you decide to use Fade Into You by Mazzy Star for it? Great song. Sick song choice for such a banger part. Shouts to Chris's part, too, in Shoot the Moon. Oh, thank you. That was a lot of unpacking to do. <laughs> but, no, basically, I think we just filmed one season for that. I think it was just one season that we filmed for Shoot the Moon. And the other question was the Mazzy Star song. I don't know. I think I just, I think I probably stole it from a skate video, a different track from by Mazzy Star. I didn't know who Mazzy Star was, but uh, just lurked her music. And I was like, damn, this would be pretty fresh if I have footy that's like heavy enough for that. For that track. Yeah. If you're listening to that track, you know you got, if you're like, I want to use Mazzy Star. You know in your head, if you have the song and you know it's an epic song, epic is a shitty word. But anyway, um, if you, like, you know you got to get A grades. Do you think like that? Like, I have the song, I got to get the A grades to fill it? For sure, and especially the way videos were being edited at that point, there was a lot of, it was kind of like heavier epic songs in skateboarding as well. A lot of ramping and, like, 
So I was just attracted to that yeah. kind of slow bang or something. Get some emotion in the video part. and Exactly. So one around this uh, Shoot the Moon year, the one of my favorite stories of all time, uh, I was with you on this trip to Montreal, and I believe – I kind of fact-checked this last night to make sure it was all right, but we were on this trip to Montreal, and at this point, it was like me, you, me, you Meyer, I think Bob Plum, I don't remember who was with us, but um, Meyer had heard from Cooley that basically there was this other crew, like kind of, I don't know if it was people at that point, but it was, it was like Jeremy, it was JP, Walker, and Sexton. They were talking shit on your snowboarding, saying you only hit small stuff, mm. and then you fucking snapped and proceeded. Once once Jed heard this, buds, he set it up like this rail that had like a 30-foot drop. Like, he just started hitting, <laughs> like, next three spots were just psycho shit. Now, because you heard that. I guess, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> to be on their side a little bit, like, some of the spots I was hitting were pretty small. So, it was like a good push as well. Yeah. I was pissed because I was like, fuck these fools, like. They're jealous that I'm, like, getting clips out here. But, like, at the same time, I'm, like, it kind of did make me start thinking. I'm, like, damn, like, I got to start hitting some bigger shit. Yeah, for them to talk shit, they are obviously impressed by, like, the technical and the mm -hmm. tricks that you were doing. And, like, at that point, that, 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 that crew of dudes was, like, pretty clicky. And, like, you hear, like, chitter chatter mm -hmm. around that, like, they're talking shit on, like, mad people. So it was just, like. Yo, fuck these. We we love <laughs> on the bomb hole talking about spite boarding. I yeah. mean, um, oh, and, a huge spite boarder. Yeah, and that's that's let's talk about that because we we were yesterday or a couple days ago when we were talking about uh, up up at that Airbnb. Let's I'll bring it bring it back to Michael Jordan, right? If you haven't seen the Last Dance, it's incredible. But this it's all about Michael Jordan's kind of path to success and all his wins and. He was he's a spite basketball player. Like he's and and essentially like if if Michael Jordan had done a ton ton of therapy, I don't think we would have the Michael Jordan we have today. Like he's <laughs> fueled by spite and anger, and it seems like you know you had some spite fueled for sure, for tricks sure. as well, right? And the, what else we were talking about up at the Airbnb was just we we're talking about ego and just how to find a balance because a lot of times, fortunately or unfortunately, you use your ego in these ways to motivate you spite boarding yep um sorry what did you ask i just was saying like you know i didn't i guess i didn't really frame up a good question but would you say that you've used spite boarding in the in the past and what like what unhealthy motivation have you found to kind of like every unhealthy motivation <laughs> jealousy spite boarding fucking everything and like anyone who's probably filmed like a really good part it's like I don't know. I've definitely gone through my phases of being like extremely jealous of other snowboarders and using that as fuel and just being like, fuck, like they got a clip on that, like being jealous and being like, oh, like I'm going to fucking like do something sicker, <laughs> which is like kind of like fucking whack, but it also helped at the time. I feel like I'm a bit, I've moved past that and kind of found a healthier way to get that motivation, but. I think, yeah, going back to the story of hearing about them talking shit, there's definitely some spite boarding going on. But we need that. Like, I was yeah, thinking it pushes about... pushes you guys. It's like, I, I don't want, I don't want uh, Michael Jordan to work on his ego because I want him to fucking dominate. Like, it, and it's it's hard to find that balance, and, and that's just a byproduct. Like, some mm -hmm. of that stuff, be it unhealthy, but you know what? At the end of the day, like, I think everybody suffers from comparison and... Of course. And it keeps, you know, you, you start comparing yourself and you like, oh, I want to do a better trick than that person. There's just a, there's just a I mean, it's a long, it's a, it's a hard thing to learn. It's a being able to do that, but also having self-compassion and self-confidence in yourself and knowing that what you're producing is still good. Not just getting too focused on what other people are doing. And I think that's where you can kind of get lost. And that's pretty, like, shitty. Well, that was one thing filming with you specifically i i remember being so much worse than you as far as like all right we get, you show up at this down bar jed just got five tricks of one of them i've never even seen anybody do before <laughs> like he's doing nbds never been done and he's just beating shit down and i'm sitting there trying to keep my head above water and so that was really healthy i found it at a younger age where i was like I'm just going to do – people fuck with me for these reasons. I'm just going to do what I can do that's good for me. But it seemed like you were on that, like, 
dude, I gotta, I'm gonna be the best. Shit. I mean, yeah, I want it to be for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fuck yeah it. like, I want it to be the best. I, I mean, s- you're not gonna I, be the best unless you focus and make a point to be the best. And and I still want to like, I don't want to be the best. I want to be. It's changed a little bit. I, I I'm not really sure how to articulate it, but um. I don't. I just want to push my. I just always want to push myself. And I think that's really important for me, and for me to feel some like gratification. It's like I need to be doing my best, and I know if I'm not. And so, but that at that time it was like, when you're younger and like you're coming up, you have something to prove, or I felt like I did, and I think younger kids should still have that. Yeah, hundred percent. Like that's how you get good footy and like you should want to be the best you should want to like shit on me and Lewif and Kuzik and like these people that were like in your shoes like I think that's healthy I like I don't know because like when I was younger I was like I want to be better than those dudes but then as you get older you realize like okay maybe I did technically harder tricks but it's like I like Daryl or like any of those dudes shit is still timeless no matter if it was technically harder or like a Benny switch two seventy or something. You're like, yeah, maybe I did. Someone did that and pretzeled out, or like someone did that. It's like you kind of you, I you build up some sort of level of taste as well, mm-hmm. and you start to realize what holds merit. And I don't know. There's and a lot. The there's way so much they to did learn. Those tricks, you know, that made them special. There's so much to learn. I don't know. I I'm not talking shit on any of the younger kids because I think there's a lot of awesome snowboarders that are coming up and that are doing a great job. Yeah, um, didn't sound like you were. Yeah, yeah. But one thing coming up, I remember th- that I think you and I both went through this was the when you're snowboarding and you're you're coming up, you think, okay, once I film that part, once I do that trick, like once I get the part and the contract, then I'm happy. Mm-hmm. And um, that is fucking broken thinking. Oh yeah. And can you explain your experience with that? I mean, I never, I don't know if I ever thought about it quite like that. I just. I don't know how to really explain it, but I can definitely see that falling. You, like, I can see how you can fall into that rabbit hole of constantly chasing that feeling. But again, I don't, unless it's really affecting you in a negative way, like, I don't think it's unhealthy. Like, it wasn't, that that part about it wasn't necessarily too unhealthy for me. I just always, I don't ever want to film a worse video part than my last video part. I don't know if that even is on par with sense. what your question is even asking, no, but that I love that. I love that you hold yourself to a high standard in that regard. Yeah, and I know it's gonna. There's obviously going to be a point where. <laughs> yeah, you can't compete with younger time at a certain point. But I think there is ways to like evolution. Like you can like change the way you snowboard, the way you look at shit, and still keep it fresh. It doesn't necessarily things can become better in different ways. It doesn't That's need true. to be all technical. So and I think that's a part of growing up and getting older too. You notice those little things, or I look back at old parts that I really liked as a kid. And I'm like, that's why I liked it, not because of this thing, or like, I don't know. There's that so many sense. pieces to the puzzle. Totally. Like when you're younger, you're coming up like young Jed is like, I'm gonna do the hardest trick mm. technically possible on this down bar. And then yeah. as you get older, you refine your style a little bit, and you're like, well, I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it where it like really looks natural. And then maybe you refine your spot or you have a different direction or you, it's really endless how you can refine and, and refine and keep your snowboarding evolving yeah. in, in certain ways. But I just find that like, I, I don't know, you know, you and I, we both struggled with some like mental issues over the years and what for, be it for me, more substance. And I know you opened up recently with some of the stuff on torment, which is awesome. Yeah. And do you think that like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like hyper focusing and channeling all that angst towards a video part. Is that like your process of how to release it or something? I don't know if I'm. No, I think that that definitely is something to focus that inner energy onto something external rather than just being stuck in your head. It's an, it's like what we go, what we can go back to is, it sounds mad corny to say, but it is an escape. It's like you become hyper-focused on this video part. So, like, for those three months or whatever, it's like I'm not thinking of – I'm still struggling with whatever it is that I'm struggling with, but it's easier to hone in on the video part and 
become just focused on that and you're not focusing about all this other negative shit you're focusing on like oh i want to i still need to get that like front board Mm -hmm. or whatever you know that being said though kind of worked both ways for me because sometimes unfortunately like like because i struggle with ocd and general anxiety and depression so sometimes unfortunately those symptoms would kind of make it so i wasn't able to to even focus on the snowboarding, like they were too intense. But what, if I was able to m- kind of get those at bay, then it was definitely easy, easier to like push that energy into a video part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you seek like professional help in any, or anything for the depression and all yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. Like, I've been in therapy for like 10 plus years. And Working on it. I mean, like, it's tough. It can de- debilitate you. and Dude, for sure. And like, yeah. I mean, we can, yeah, I'm definitely down to, like, talk about this stuff because I think it's super important. It's important for people to hear, I think, that are also going through it and yeah, aren't definitely. seeking help, you know? And, like, I try to do it on my own for a while, like, the first three years or whatever. I think I kind of started first having those symptoms when I was, like, 19. So shortly, I was into, like, I had already filmed a few video parts and stuff, but I went from being very not a care in the world to, like, these symptoms that I didn't even know existed and I didn't know what how to interpret them and I just felt like super fucked up basically and it was also hard to balance it was just a really hard time to balance my snowboarding like a career but also like mental health and even figuring out what it is that is wrong with me and yeah I don't really know what you guys asked (laughs) but (laughs) oh that's perfect yeah it's perfect because I I just think I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you bring it up and you're like, yeah. think to the outside, you see, okay, Jed Anderson, he's filmed the most incredible video parts. The guy fucking looks cool. He seems cool. Seems like everything's like, and and really, you that's like testament. You never know what's going on on the inside with anybody. Mm. You know, they're how bad they're suffering, even though externally they might be, you know, looking, have big old smile on their face or whatever's going on. For sure. That's all think- we get too, like the public... Like, mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I haven't spent much time with you, you mm-hmm. know, like, outside looking in, I see your video parts, you're killing it. Yeah, yeah. Wicked stylish, you always look happy in your in your shots, so it's like, you don't even, I would have never guessed you were struggling with that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think it's something, too, when people are struggling with those things, it's sometimes a defense mechanism to hide, try yeah, to hide, hide it, it more, um, which I definitely did, and also just trying to convince myself, like, I'm fine, I'm fine, like, and I didn't want people to think that I was, like, bombed or whatever like going through shit and yeah I don't know now it's like I'm extremely open about it open about it because I think if I would have heard someone talking about it I would have been like yo I feel like that like yeah you would identify it and been able to understand and probably like yeah if there is people struggling out there like and you're scared to get help or like because it is extremely intimidating and like talking to a random person and sometimes you do talk to a therapist and you're like this person like doesn't get it and like unfortunately that that's that happens Mm -hmm. and like but i think like health is everything and if you're going to spend money on anything spend it on your health like and especially your mental health like you without that like you're fucked especially as you get older and start thinking and analyzing more and more Mm -hmm. and we just live in a fucking crazy world right now yeah i'm sure a lot of people are like feeling all i like Invest in yourself, like, invest in your health, like, that's, like, and, like, if the same goes, if, like, you think your friend or something is struggling, like, talk to them, or, like, I don't know, there's ways of going about it, you know, read the situation, read the room, but, and it's it's hard to be open, like, if, for me to even, like, talk about this openly now is, like, a huge step for me, but since I've done that, it's, like, you realize, like, people care about you, people, like, want to help you, and, like, other people that you wouldn't think are maybe going through similar shit. Yeah, everyone's got their own stuff. Yeah, for sure. I, I noticed the very unhealthy coping mechanism that I see <laughs> a lot of snowboarders use or skateboarders or mm-hmm. people. It's, you know, the, the video part is a great example of that because you're like, okay, in the winter, I got a reason to wake up in the morning. I got yeah. a reason to get out of bed. I got a sense of purpose. I'm working on this thing. And it's like I get my little, I might not be using drugs, but every time I get a back lip, pretzel i fucking get a little hit you know (laughs) and i feel like us as snowboarders use that that action that kind of like hyper focus on a task or the the process of uh, i'm gonna make this 
video part great or I'm going to win these contests. And you're able, you're able to use that as kind of like your, your coping mechanism in some, in some way where you don't have to necessarily like, you don't have to take a look at all the shit you got going on and it's an, and it's an escape. When you take that away, like you're, why, you're like, why the fuck am I depressed? I got no reason to wake up in the morning. Did you ever experience shit like that? Yeah, of course. I mean, and that goes back to what we were talking about with the filming the video part and obsessing over that for that time. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that there is ways to make that a healthy r- routine, but when you're avoiding emotions by doing that, that's when it gets tricky. When you're just avoiding shit, you're being productive. So you're like, I'm being productive and like, I'm not drinking, I'm not doing drugs but and I'm being productive, but it's like, you're still avoiding the shit, like the issue. Then it's kind of just, it's just prolonging mm-hmm. the, I don't know, the problem. And it builds up too, I, I imagine. For sure. But The more oh. you avoid it and the more you don't talk about it. But then there's also the other thing thinking about just in my own head on this stuff is like there's a lot of positives too, right? So That's what, yeah, of so, course. So if you look at like for, for I'm going to speak on myself's behalf, the thing I experienced is like let's say film for Get Real, I would get a trick and be like, holy shit, I didn't know I could do that. Like that was that was kind of right at that top edge of my ability level. And then you're like that gives you some confidence to try another hard trick, and you realize you get you get comfortable being uncomfortable. You learn like that. That's one thing I've noticed with you. Is that like a lot of people want to backlip the triple kink, but when you're strapped in, staring at the thing from the top, you're like, you might claim it from the couch, but then you you get there and you're like, you have this un- unbelievable ability to be like, this this is what I'm fucking doing, mm. you know? Where does that come from? How do you how do you get yourself to try that shit, dude? I think I'm just still really passionate about snowboarding and like how I, I, I still like I haven't even been to a fucking premiere in so long, but I still have that premiere mentality. Like, I'm, like if I'm at the premiere, like, I just imagine that clip, and I'm like, am I going to want this shit in my part? Or, like, when I look at this part, like, I'm about to not snowboard. Like, say, like, right now, it snows, and there's, like, a clip I still really want to get, and I know I'm not going to be snowboarding for five months. It's like, I don't want to be in that five months and not snowboarding and be like, I should have done that. And, like, it's, imp- it's important to know your limit and your capabilities, which comes with trial and error, of course, but... Once you kind of figure that out and you film enough video parts, it's like, I feel like a lot of us are at a point now, even though shit's scary, it's like, I know that I'm probably capable of doing this and I'm going to, like, beat myself up later if I, if I don't get it. And, like, I just, I think about the finished product. Like, we're all working toward that finished piece. And I'm, I'm when I'm scared, I think about that a lot. I'm like, am I able, like, am I just scared or is this a, just a stupid spot? Because sometimes it is a stupid spot, and I'm just, like, not thinking, right? But it's important to step back, be like, I know my capabilities, I know my level of snowboarding. Like, if I'm just scared right now, I just have to push through it. And, like, I don't know. That's kind of how That's sick. You think it. about that in the moment at the spot. Dude, I think about that all the time. I'm like, because, dude, like Chris said, it's like, I don't want to necessarily do a lot of the shit I've done, but I know I want the clip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if I could just, if I could just transport and just be like, wake up and have the clip, have the that'd clip. be fucking great. <laughs> but I know I have to go through this shit and Do it makes work. it that much more rewarding. It's like, it is a high. You're like, I was fucking scared and I did it and I have a clip and that's going to be in my video part. And you're it's like, dude, that's why every fucking, anyone who's filmed more than one video part, it's that feeling. Mm-hmm. You're like, you will, and that that's just gonna be there. You're gonna have that video part now, and you're gonna be like, I remember I was scared of shit, and I like persevered and did it. And then that builds, and that grow. That's a snowball effect. And yeah. It, and yeah. if you get rolling on a good winter, and you get some crazy clips going, there's like you can do shit that you never thought you was even possible. Exactly. exactly. And um, dude, going we're gonna jump around chronologically because who gives a shit? Yeah. But like going back to this example, one session we had that I remember was like that in Japan filming for Crazy Loco. Uh, we were hitting this gap to down rail, and I was warming up doing a switch 180 to 50. I wanted a cab 270 it, and you wanted a switch back 270 it. And I remember just, like, feeding off of your energy, and it was so sick because I remember one point you're like, all right, we're both doing it. Fuck it. Full commit blood pack. Let's try. <laughs> Full commit blood pack. Those are shit. Like, <laughs> like, like, we both, like, shook on it, and we're like, I'm 
putting this up or I'm going home in a body bag. <laughs> and it, it wasn't the craziest spot, but it was oh. just sick to have that, like, you know, mentality. That, that mentality. Yeah. And that's the thing. Another thing I think about at the spot, there is that you're building up where you're either going to try it or you're not. And I fucking hate being in that moment <laughs> of debate. And I try to get it over with as quick as I can. And I'm like, I'm either going to do it now Maybe in 10 minutes, but, like, you get to a point where you're just, like, you scare yourself too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe not on that, like, uh, that spot, but, like, there is spots like that definitely where, and that's the thing. It's just, like, you have to, there's, you, you can be smart about snowboarding. Like, you have to be able to look at a spot and know if you're capable to do it. There's shit that I'm not. And then, then there's stuff that I am, but I'm scared. And it's, like, really important to figure out your level of riding. Because you can, you don't have to be the best. Like you can still film a sick ass part. That's not the scariest spots or the hardest tricks. But it's like, just don't be dumb about it. Like, don't throw yourself into some shit that you're like, I'm most likely gonna get bodied. But I got yeah. a quick Patreon question that you brought up, Crazy Loco. This is from Clarky. Um, how many times slash days did you get bodied on that massive yellow down flat down at the end of Crazy Loco? Much love from the Wildwood crew. Down flat down. Crazy Loco, I don't remember that one. Was it the one at the same spot, the Japan? The one you did switch back. It, that was white, the one you switched back to. I no, don't know. The, the one you did back 50 on? That's at that same spot. Yeah, though. but that was white. The, the guy who got the cover on. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Maybe that's, his colors off? Yeah, his colors off. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, the cover shot. I bung yeah. I one man bungeed you into that shot. Yeah. If that's he what says massive about. yellow down flat down, but who knows? Maybe his TV colors are yeah, off. Yeah, maybe he's got to reset know. that white balance. Maybe he's on that night. You put that night on and it night vision. He's got night mode. Night yeah, mode. he's got night mode. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it took, like, it didn't, if that's the one we're talking about, that one didn't take that long. It was definitely really scary. I think. Dude, that one was fucked. The <laughs> stairs were, like, pretty dry. You don't want to fall on some of those scary ones. It's like, yeah. just get them done, right? Yeah, that one didn't take too long. I didn't even, like, really come off the end that good, honestly, but it played. I think it's had some compression at the bottom. Yeah. That's like, yeah, who bungee did you do that? I, I swear someone oh, someone board slid it too. Yeah, Eric Leon did. Eric, Leon. Eric did. Yep. Yo, air horn for that board slide. Is that? Fuck. I wouldn't board slide that. You know what we got to talk about, Jed? Hmm. This is something that only you and I suffer from. Not, I mean, a lot of people suffer from this, but you and I can relate to this. So you snowboard goofy, skateboard regular. I do. I snowboard regular, skateboard goofy, fingerboard regular. I uh, skateboard goofy, oh, snowboard you, regular. No, no way. way. Surf goofy. What? Yeah. Yeah, I surf goofy too. But going back to your tricks, I hear this all the time. Let's say you, you've done all this crazy shit regular, and then you do a switch trick, and people are like, well, it's not a switch. He skates goofy. What that's do you what, have to say you about hear? that? I hear that yeah. all the time. I don't give a shit. <laughs> In my it head, it all feels the same. It's weird. Like, really? Well, like when I, it just feels normal to skate one way. And oh normal. no, no, that yeah. feels, that feels, but like, but switch still feels like switch. Yeah, yeah. But just I, I think there weird. is an advantage in some shit, like a switchback lip on a snowboard. I haven't done one in a while, actually. But like when I was doing them a lot, it was like, like I could do them on a skateboard, and it felt very similar. So I could see that translating. But it's like, I mean, I don't give a fuck what if people like. Yeah, it's try still, to like take away switch from either way. Yeah. yeah I you, don't even care if it's switch or not. Like I still can go in both ways doing shit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. If you can do it regular <laughs> yeah. and you do it switch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's doesn't, just, it doesn't bug me too much. I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a shot at, uh, Harrison Gordon because I saw you drop in at Woodward the other day and you did something and it was switch. And he said, and that's, this is where this conversation is actually okay. coming from. Really? Yeah. And he's Jeez, like, Harry. it actually doesn't count. He's not, it's not really switch because he skates goofy. Sounds like some jealousy talking to me. Yeah. yeah. Give a little. Yeah, cause just, still you grew, you just learned how to ride. You just learned how to ride. ride one way, and that was like your dominant way. Mm -hmm. So it's still you got to learn how to ride. Switch I think you learn th the yeah, trick. Th th I don't know how it happened for you, but for me, the summer before the winter that I started snowboarding, I had started skateboarding. Because my birthday is in August, and I got a skateboard for my birthday. And then we went to the rental zone at the ski hill, and they're like, they, I think they like still like stand there and they, they push, push you, you yeah. and I put my right foot out, and they're like. That's which footage you are. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't make the connection that, like, oh, I already started skating, like, that way, and I don't think anyone... Like, yeah. Like, we didn't really think about it, so I just... Until, like, someone noticed it, or maybe my brother noticed it. Yeah, something. for real. But, that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. how I learned, too. They pushed you, and, oh, that's which... There's yeah, a, yeah. Which way would you slide if you were going to run and slide on ice or whatever? Yeah. It's funny. They set you up, and 
that's what you just are. what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you look, there's a lot of notables. You got uh, Jesse Bertner, uh, Ika Backstrom, UC Oxenen. Really? I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know um, there was that many. Fuck. Ika, did I ever say that? Um, there's tons more. I, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting, but there's like, there's actually, it's pretty common um, in, in that way. But for me, it was a black snow. I had a black snow that was just set up regular, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's <laughs> what is, you were. This is, I'm regular. Yeah. But then it really it, just comes down to what setup you get with a board or who sets you up. And but there are certain tricks. Be. Like I swear, like, is it like you're good at like switch front boards. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm better at regular front boards. True. So then it's like yeah, then, yeah. then they're like I don't, I don't fucking know. But but I will say I'm better. I'm probably better at switch back clips. But when it's like a trick, you can do both the same ways. This is the thing that's different though. Is if I'm gonna bomb a fucking hill and I'm going goof like switch, I'm it's fucking terrifying. Like if I'm, I can't go yeah. fast, you know, going fast at a jump or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Super uncomfortable. Yeah, who knows? Um. So earlier we were talking about get real. Mm-hmm. Uh. On that trip, or while we were filming for that movie, you at one point basically were like, "Hey, I got to dip. I got to go to the Canadian Open." And what happened? So there's these passes called the Canada West Pass. Basically, you have to, I don't know if you have to, I don't even know if it still exists, honestly, but at that time, you either had to do a certain, you had to do a certain number of contests and do well enough in them to get this pass, which is basically a pass that is good for all of Western Canada. And I think that I hadn't really, like, done enough or done well enough in enough contests because I had been traveling and filming, but I still wanted this pass. So I think my brother convinced me, he's like, you should come back and do the Canadian Open if you want this pass, because you save, like, mad money. It's like, you can go to Whistler, like, everywhere. Yeah, that's like, dope. And those, I mean, I don't even know what a Whistler Blackcomb ticket is these days, probably. Like, yeah, just the ticket alone. Buku bucks. But, 280 or something, 300 Canadian. So, yeah, I was like, okay, yeah, I got to go back and do it. Um, And, yeah, I just went, he convinced me to go do the half-pipe contest, and I don't know how the stars align, but I ended up doing good in it. What did you just say? What I got, happened? I got, I got number one. You got he first won. place in a half pipe contest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Coming from a rail trip, he's like, I got to go do the Canadian Open. He goes and wins the fucking half pipe contest. Comes back to a rail trip. Not, I don't, I'm not, but like the level of riding of like the Canadian Open versus like the U.S. Open is obviously different. So it's not like I won the U.S. Open or something. But it was still cool. It was still like, was there any notable people that you beat down? Just some nerds. Just I some- don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You, they've been yeah. training for this half life contest their whole guys, career. I remember, like, yeah, some of those. There's one homie that's pretty funny. We used to, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just some nerds. For um, you to show up, though, and just beat them, that's pretty But tight. you, you essentially, I remember your mom around Get Your Real Year was talking about you maybe still going to the Olympics or you or something. Is that ever a thing? I think after that, I was like, fuck, should I, like, <laughs> try to, like, go to the Olympics? Like, after you got first place? Yeah, because I was like, yeah, you can All get these the dudes are like team. going to the Olympics, I think, or trying to go to the Olympics, and I beat them. So like, who's so, dude? Canada is stacked in the slope department. Okay, they got nobody in pipe. I think the next wave of latexes <laughs> dynasty would be to go to the Olympics. Dude, I haven't gone a full size half pipe in so long. Dude, the full size it looks is, fucking yeah. terrifying. Icy too. Yeah, an icy full size is just. Dude, that is that is so gnarly. Yeah. yeah, props to those guys. Also, going back to those times, they're a little fuzzy, but it's fun to think back. You used to skate that park in Calgary. Mills. Mills. You were the, like a Mills child. Yeah. And they had like the big old concrete vert ramp and shit. Mm-hmm. And that's like, I don't know, it's just crazy watching you skate that place. You just fucked that place Mills is so up. sick. Still my favorite skate park. And it's just like, somehow still lights 24 hours a day, 365, makes zero sense. Just right by the Greyhound station, so it's like there's cutty people coming in and out. Kind of, you can't really see it from any of like the major roads, so it's just kind of like this weird zone of like sketchy shit happening. But as like a teenager, and still now, it's like I love it. And it was so I met like some of my best, most of my best friends I met there, because at that point growing up, there was only one skate park, and that was it. And it's fucking huge, and so everyone from all the suburbs everywhere would come down. Like, I wouldn't even. I was lucky because I live pretty close to it, like a 15, 20 minute bike ride. But that whole yeah. big city only has that one skate park. Now they have more, uh-huh. but like, yeah, when I was growing up, like that's all they had. Wow. But like, it was amazing because like I met all my friends there. 
Like, if that wasn't the case, we probably wouldn't have even met each other. That's wild. Yeah. And you knew every nook and cranny of that place to the point where you could skate the concrete vert ramp, which was the scariest thing. Yeah, I've I don't think I could skate life. it now, but I was, like, skating it every single day for, like, just go there after school until 10. Concrete vert ramp sounds... Dude, and gnarly. it's, like, they used the wrong <laughs> cement, so, like, the first winter it got all bubbly. Oh, really? Like, it's, just like, sidewalk concrete, basically. Ah. Uh. It's pretty, like, shitty, but it's, like, also the best. Yeah. I feel like those spaces are so sacred the skate park I, I spent so much time as a kid there and it's like i don't know they're there is they're as sacred as a church to me dude it's fucking crazy like like i said i met all my friends there like pretty much like the dudes i talk to every day i met there still That's so cool every day and there yeah there was just nothing like that and funny enough like i moved to toronto six or seven years ago and when i moved my brother opened an indoor skate park i was like what the fuck like Wait till I leave to do this. He opened one back yeah. in Calgary. Like yeah. kind of tying together with the riders on board thing. It's called ah. the compound. But just another sick thing that I don't know, my family's done. Not That's cool. I'm not bigging up myself, I'm bigging up them. Yeah, yeah. But like just like I don't know. I think like him having kids and stuff now, like when we were growing up there was an indoor park. There was Park four oh three, it was called, and then another indoor park called Source Park, that um store that I was talking about that I rode for. But for the past like 15 years or something, no indoors. So yeah, I think he just really kind of saw the that. opportunity of like, I think, yeah, like I said, him having kids, he's like, well, shit, like they don't have a spot to go to. Good for the yeah. community. Yeah. You know, what's also so cool about, the, you know, the things like your, your family's doing. And I was talking to Beth about this, your mom. Uh, and it's like, you take somebody like, let's take like Lucas Magoon or yourself or like you, you're these people like, or myself, you, you're, you're not going to be success. That you're probably going to be bad in school. Your p- teachers are going to tell you that you're fucking horrible in school. Your coach is going to be like, dude, you're fucking around too much. Like, you're not helping us win the, this team. You're too much ADD. But then you got skateboarding and snowboarding. That's like, come on over. Come fuck. And, oh, you're a shithead? And you want to, like, come hang out at the skate park and just take all that angst and put it towards skateboarding. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you're a product of that in some senses. Yeah, I think in some senses for sure. I'm lucky enough to have had a family that was down for me to like or and to support me to go do that or saw that that was an option because I think yeah when you are a kid like that you need that freedom and that environment to flourish and to figure your shit out because maybe like a traditional learning situation or a traditional sport might not work for you yeah it's too institutionalized for some people mm-hmm yeah, if you're like me, when when somebody says, "Hey, you need to go do this," the little punk kid inside me says, "Oh, you want me to do that?" I'm do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to do the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> still like that. Yeah, <laughs> which is perfect for skating. Mm-hmm. Or then it also works in the same way where somebody like Jed, when you say, "I don't think you can do that," yeah, that's <laughs> that's when he's going to do it. Try to do it. Yeah. Do you know what it might be time for? Because getting past. A little part that we like to call Name That Video Part. All right, Latex Mansion. Uh, how are we feeling today? Generally? Like confident. Generally <laughs> no, not generally. Well, actually, first, generally. generally. How are you feeling? Feeling great. Okay, second, confidence level as far as getting the correct answer to this Name That Video Part song. Five. Five? I know I'm really good if I hear a song, I'm like, yeah, it's been used. But I can't, I'm not maybe the best at knowing what it was used in. Well, this one's a meatball. If you don't get it, your your credibility and your core score may plummet. That's all right. Okay, here we go. Blue. I even knew that one, dude. We might have actually done that one before. I'm running out of ideas. Are that you? is correct. That's the Lewis <laughs> parody. What you got in there is a uh, bomb hole cooler full Fuck of some yeah. bomb. We got a bomb hole coffee mug. Ah, uh, thanks, sure. guys. We got a Stony Buds air freshener in there. Hot throw item. That, throw that. In, uh, this thing is so sick, actually. Yeah. OG, just very good. Thank you. Cooler, no problem. Uh, th- I'm gonna do a little side note. That hurdy gurdy man was used by another crew as well. Kind of an unspeakable reuse. Just gonna throw that out there. I forget who it was, but. I remember listening to it. Like, Can I talk some shit right now on yeah. Unspeakable Reuse? Yes. Jake Johnson, Minefield, 
Burton used it this year. Oh yeah, unforgivable. Yeah, that's what awful. the that's fuck. That's who what we, used it before? Jake Johnson in Alien Workshop Minefield. Oh, and they threw it out because they're like, it's skating, it's cool. I we can, we can reuse it. That was a twisted move. Though. Or maybe they didn't even know. It's actually what we referred to as a no-fly zone. <laughs> yeah. Absolute no-fly zone. Um, okay, part two of Name That Video part. It's for the listeners. Here we go. Breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. I don't know that one. Uh, okay, if you know the answer, comment on Jed's photo on Instagram when his episode comes out. What do they win? Sticker pack. Thanks. Sick. Oh, yeah, they may or may not receive a sticker pack. <laughs> Thank you guys for playing. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. Sorry. I'm going to you guys on your bus. Huh? No, it's, it's true. They know it. Yeah, we uh, we keep a loose operation around Credibility. Here. If yeah. they send enough DMs, they're definitely getting the sticker pack. It's As Buds puts it, it's kind of a squeaky, squeaky yeah, wheel squeaky gets wheel, the like, situation. If they're like, never got my sticker pack from episode 34, I'll like put it in there real quick in the mail. Yeah, fuck it. So, yeah, anyone uh, who wants to fire a DM who didn't get one, send it in. I think while we're on the subject of video parts, uh, well, we're off of it now, but we're going to go back to it. Let's get back to it. <laughs> um, so I get a guest question from uh, Tanner Pendleton. Now, the guest question is presented by Solomon Snowboards. I ride the six-piece. It's, uh, it's a hot item. Uh, great for riding park. And if you're looking for a premium board, pick up a six-piece. Now, we got a guest question from none other than T. Pendle Snake Tanner Pendleton. Here we go. Yo, what's up, Jed and Chris and Stony Buds? So, Jed, I'm wondering, you told me once that you would treat finding music like a job. Like you used to roll into a cafe and listen to music for hours until you'd find something good. So I guess I'm curious if you're still sort of on this same grind uh, when it comes to finding inspiration. Um, and I guess in general, you know, whether it's music or art, uh, skateboarding or snowboarding, uh, I'm curious to know where you're looking or where you might start if you're looking to get inspired. Okay. Thanks for the question, Tanner. I miss you a lot. Uh, fucking hope we can... Kick it soon. Um, kind of two parts to that question. But with the music thing, for sure, especially if I'm trying to find a song to use, like, oh, I, even even if not, like, at least once a week, I'll spend a few hours trying to find new music. And then, but if I know that if there's a project coming up that I need to find music for, then I'll definitely just, like, hammer down and get in a YouTube wormhole, Spotify wormhole, um, yeah, whatever. And then as far as, like, inspiration otherwise for, I don't know. I don't really feel that I um, purposely purposefully seek that out, but I actually find a lot of, like, shit on Instagram. <laughs> just, like, I don't know. I feel like I follow some cool people and generally just get inspired by people I know. So I'm lucky enough to have uh, a lot of interesting and, awesome people in my life so just through instagram seeing what they're up to is like motivating and i don't know it's pretty much it for that where'd the inspiration for latex mansion come from just throwing two words together that sounds sweet it's my homie colton we give him a hair air horn uh he's just like twisted genius i don't know he, he was probably he's just like has says all this crazy shit all the time i think he just said it and i thought it was really funny I think it's dope. <laughs> I don't even know what it means or like where it even came from. He it just, just sounds cool. He just said it and I was like, oh, this shit's really funny. At the time, at least. And then I, that was like when Instagram just started. I was like, oh, make it this. And, and it stuck. Yeah. Now, now we refer to Jed, not as Jed, as Latex or Latex Manch or Manch. Manch. Or I've heard Tex as well. Tex. It's not bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But something that maybe some of the listeners or viewers may not know is like how coveted 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 the video part song is like a, like the music is so important so you know let's take Tanner Pendleton who he makes the Vans videos you know I remember talking to him about songs and they have these like secret song vaults with like editing folders and it's like fucking locked you're not he's not showing you that shit he and there's like it's kind of a cool deal like finding these songs for these parts and they, they really make or break the movie why do you like robot food Snowboard movie's great, but, but the tricks are great, but the soundtrack's incredible. Same with Dude, soundtrack. Fing, Finger on the Trigger. 
the like foundation of my music taste has come from skateboarding and snowboarding videos, and like, yeah. So it's just, it's so important. I have full. I have a folder on my Spotify that just says part. And I don't. I don't. I purposely don't listen to those songs mm-hmm. either because I don't want to get burnt on. Get them. sick of one. I have songs that I haven't from like four years ago that I. I'm like one day I'll use them, <laughs> and I try not to fucking listen to them because I'm like this is a heater. Like, I want to, but it's like. I remember in like the kids know shit like Mikey boarded to bad brands or something and I looked them up or like bad brands is dope like watching a four in one and there's like a minor threat song or something it's like all introductory level to like maybe the music I'm into now but it's like I don't know I just like Bittner like uses like a Jaquan song and then uh Benny used that Mob Deep song. It's yeah. just like, dude, I remember all this shit like so well. So like, I think that also knowing that like that's kind of shaped my music taste. I want to like make sure that I'm doing the same for other people. That exactly. makes a lot of sense. He's yeah. always up yeah. on the shit. He's always up on like, if I think I'm up on something, he's de- he's been up on it for like <laughs> he's been up on it for two, a year. three years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, year. yeah, exactly. And music just controls like the feeling of a part in a video. I mean all. We just said, yeah, like, finger on the trigger, like, uh, kids know, um, robot food, like, all completely different vibes, but all great music, and, like, they definitely, I don't know. Yeah, it's huge. Super it just strong. Sets the, super yeah, it sets strong. the mood of the movie, and bad song will make good snowboarding look bad sometimes. I mean, Straight editing up. is obviously so important, yeah. too, but, I mean, yeah. Going back to when we were filming together, I remember you would be in the van, like, occasionally just to go headphones in just zoning out right <laughs> yeah. right like it's probably thinking about your part i don't know it's like sometimes yeah but i think on trips too it's like you don't get any time to just do that i agree with that sometimes it's nice just to throw the headphones i was on. thinking about it last night I, actually i hit the headphones this morning because i'm like i haven't just like listened to music or a podcast for like the last two weeks and i'm someone who needs alone time and i haven't got any of that and i just start maybe getting like irritable or I don't know. It's like important to sometimes just like take that time for yourself. When I do that, people give me shit. If I'm on a trip and they catch me with headphones in the van or something, they give yeah. me shit. And it's like sometimes you need that. Buds yeah. is up in, up on the music. He's always he's always got the shit. I, don't I know like about. to have headphones in, just listening. Yeah. Oh, I think it's like super relaxing too, and like I think it's I don't know healthy to just shut down for a bit and like shut your mouth. And Especially you're in a, a street it. trip and you're in the van for twenty hours scoping. Yeah, it's gnarly. In an Airbnb. Or maybe Airbnb ba- and, and the size you, of this garage. Yeah, and then you battle a trick, and then you go back to, like, a tiny-ass Airbnb. Yeah, and there's just Some, like, no foreign room. place, and you're just eating, like, shit. And you're like, it's all you got, maybe. Like, kick it. <laughs> but then sometimes you got to get that aux cord and just go crazy. True. There's those moments, yeah. too. Throw on some Waka Flocka or OG Mako and just want to <laughs> run through a fucking wall before you hit the down bar. Get you people know? hyped. Dude, there's that one video of like Bob Blum. I remember like you're playing like Waka Flocka so loud. It's like bow, 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 bow like, on the way to a spot. I think we, I think me and Chris got along instantly because we were both like G's, huge young Jeezy fans. Ah, mm-hmm. good that was mark. like the first CD I bought. That's right. Yeah. Is that what he says? Yeah. Oh yeah. Jeezy's dope. Well, maybe let's hit some hot takes, huh? What do you guys think? Yeah, we haven't done Damn. hot takes. Okay. First question, always ask it. Michael Jordan of snowboarding, who you got? I knew this shit was gonna come up. I, I can't. I, I don't. I don't know if I can answer this because it's like an impossible question to answer. But I can give my who like I looked at as my Michael Jordan growing up would have been like, or actually, if I were to say it, I, I'm just gonna say like Whitlake for. That's a sneak attack. Fucking great answer. <laughs> from from me. It's a great Whitlake answer. listens to the show, too. He's going to be oh, stoked. Oh, no way. Yeah. Whitlake doesn't get the shine he deserves. Fuck, no, he doesn't. I mean, I think, like, maybe people that are a bit older than myself are, like, but, like, I think, like, a lot of people don't know, like, how fucking sick Whitlake is. He's or dope. was. Or, like, I'm sure he still is. Go on YouTube, type in Scotty Whitlake. Dude, he just, like. Happy hour. Something I also want to touch on, like, just, like, being authentic carries so much weight and it's like i think a lot of snowboarders before us had that authenticity and it kind of got watered down a little bit with a lot of people but 
you look at like like think about like Whitlake, Mikey, Mark Frank. It's yeah, like they're just themselves and like and it shows people. and like th- th- yeah, I don't know. Shit just so sick. I don't know. That Whitlake was really sick. Real we'll one. get him in this booth one of these days. So, that would be it awesome episode yeah. it, dude he's such an interesting dude and like you learn about i'm just yeah i have so much respect for people they're snowboarding but also like how they are as a person outside of snowboarding and like what they're into or like what kind of shit they get up to and like they're just interesting people apart from their snowboarding and yeah there's a lot of interesting from what, i don't know a lot about what like and that's fucking sick too he it's ever mysterious re- rode his bike across country yeah like he's got all kinds of you, fixed gear too, right? Yeah, he was into yeah. yeah, he was into all kinds of crazy stuff over the years, and you're just like, and he looks interesting, really interesting. He doesn't give a fuck. Well, he's, that's the thing; it comes back to being authentic. Like, it is not scared to be himself, really. And that's like it just yeah, I don't know. I think we lost some of that for a while. Yeah, people get too cookie cutter or something, trying to be a certain way because they think they have to be. Okay, well maybe this ties in uh, another hot take: worst trend in snowboarding. I guess that, like, just trying, and, like, I'm definitely guilty of it, but just trying, you have to imitate, you have to, and every, no one is 100% original, like, we all are imitating something and taking pieces, but it's, like, I think sometimes within snowboarding, it's, like, people are just taking the the obvious route and, like, not working hard enough to try to, like, take inspiration from other areas or... Is it like music's like a good example? It's like someone will use like a song or a genre, and then like the next year everyone uses it, or like someone does a trick a certain way, and then everyone's doing it that way. It's like yo, figure like your your own lane. So, in the words of uh, Ace Ventura, <laughs> uh, I was unaware the Wachutu are biters. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> everybody's biters. It's actually after the little guy bites him, and of course, like I'm a biter. Like everyone's. Everyone's a biter. Yeah, it's like there's, there's a tasteful way of doing it. Yeah. And sometimes, like, people just get away with some, like, ruthless shit that you're just like, come on. Yeah, but everybody's, if you're, if you're tied in and you see through the shit, you're like, yeah, dope. We, we know where you're going with this direction. Yeah, like, come on. Okay, another hot take. Toque. What about it? Well, Americans probably don't know what that is. Oh, so yeah. Is it, what, do you think, what do you think about know. the word toque and what is it? It's a beanie, but a toque. Yeah. What do Canadians call resi tip toques? Is there a name for that? I don't. I think just resi tip. I wouldn't even say toque. I would just say the resi. Okay. I thought for some reason toques just had resi tips. Oh, the toque had to have a resi. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I, like, cause okay. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe there is like. I just like yeah toque. toque. Okay. What about the word uh, washroom? What about? What is about that a it? Canadian thing too? <laughs> yeah, they say washroom instead of bathroom. Well, well, that's say why. Too, well, right? that's why when you're international, when you look for a bathroom, it says WC. Oh, well, it's it's a water closet. closet. Yeah, water closet. Water yeah. closet. I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's probably what Canadians or the uh, U.S. We just throw our own Fuck, bathroom. Well, we're ignorant. We make everybody yeah. learn our shit. Okay, um, another Canadian term, Timmy's. What about it? Timmy's, Tim Hortons. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Buds hates it. Not down. For just the name or the place? The place. You're a Duncan guy? No, I just like, if I want to, I guess if we, if, <laughs> when I'm on, when I'm on a trip. You're a Chevy guy. I am a Sevy guy, but no, if I want a coffee, if I want a coffee, I don't go to Sevy, I don't go to Timmy's or I mean, yeah, it's not like, I'm not like, I go and get a good coffee. No, yeah, same, but it's like, on a trip, it's just like, fuck it, like, we're going to Tim's, like. But if we, their sandwiches taste like cardboard, their donut holes are pretty sweet. Yeah. The funny shit is, when I'm in Canada, I'm like, I'm getting my Timmy's in. It's like. Like six times a day, It's almost like you (laughs) go into, like. It's like seeing a, a tourist attraction for me. So I get the coffee. I get the Tim bits. I'm smashing Timmy Ho's, and Bud's is so fucking bummed the whole time, too. <laughs> Anywhere but Timmy. Just, like, to go there every morning. Yeah, maybe that's a little Middle of the day the and afternoon. It's just... But fuck, Chris is trying me. to get it in. I got another hot take for you. Uh, earlier on this podcast, Andy Wright said you were, quote-unquote, the laziest person he's worked with. What do you got on that? <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> uh... I mean, maybe at that time, like, I was. I don't know. But, like, throw me under the bus, like, 12 years after that is, like, kind of fucked up. I mean, obviously, I don't think that's <laughs> that the... fucked up. Like, I haven't been on a trip with him for mad long, but, shit, maybe I was just mad lazy then. But, like, I also remember him, like, he just wouldn't shoot shit sometimes. 
and or like he would take one picture and sit in the car for hours. It's like pretty weak. But whatever, fuck, I don't know. Maybe he's not like that anymore either. He's probably more like that now. As Maybe the, as the years go on. But what do you got? What do you got on the uh, beaver slap? In the lift line yeah. thing. I'm down. You hit him. You've done it. I'll hit it. Okay, respect. Okay, what do you got for wackest brand? Oh shit. Oh shit. That's a heavy question. Oh shit. <laughs> He's all good. He gets all focused. Oh, oh shit, there's some whack brands out there. No, I'm just trying to think of, I'm trying to think if someone's like done something really like whack recently. Uh shit. I don't know, like candy grind or something. It's pretty That's a pretty fair. Acceptable answer. Yeah. yeah. Good answer. Well, uh, last question. Best style on a snowboard? No, there's so much. There's so many. I can't name one, but I like, like I'll just say recently, Dan has awesome style. Danimals. I like watching him snowboard. It's actually the correct answer. <laughs> but then I also <laughs> really like, like I love like Jake OE. Jake and OE like it's like completely sick. different, but. And then. Jake OE is authentic. Let's talk Icon Pass. Now on sale, claim the best deals of the season before promos go away and prices go up on May 5th. Own the season, own the stories, own the stoke. For winter 21-22, unlock access to more than 40 Icon Pass destinations where you can explore wide open spaces. I personally like to explore Brighton Resort. I like to check out Snowbird. With exclusive spring savings and purchase options, including special pricing for 2021 pass holder renewals, and a payment plan from $0 down and 0% APR, your season of Stoke is closer than ever. Explore pass options and take advantage of limited springtime offers before promos go away and prices go back up on May 5th. Let's talk about their options, buds. The Icon Pass for $999, unlocking the most days, the most mountains, and no blackout dates. The Icon Base Pass for $729 opens up a season of adventure with limited blackout dates. And the Icon Session Pass 4-Day for only $399 allows you to kickstart your ride. As with last year, every Icon Pass comes with adventure assurance, including credits in the case of a COVID-19 closure and the option to defer the value of an unused pass, no questions asked. Every moment spent in the mountains is a new opportunity for discovery and connection. Connection to the mountains and connection to each other. Own the Stoke today for the best prices of the season at IconPass.com. Let's uh, let's pivot. I haven't been saying pivot. My shit's in airplane mode. I don't know why it's buzzing. But uh, airplane connected to Wi-Fi. That's what it is. So let's pivot. So you grew up in Calgary, and eventually, I don't know how many years ago, but you moved to Toronto. Now, why did you pick Toronto to move to? I had been living in Calgary my whole life, and the next closest major city to Calgary is Vancouver, which I would go to all the time growing up. Been there hundreds of times. Two of my best friends, my friend Michael and my friend Dan, moved to Toronto. Um, yeah, give them an air horn for sure. Uh, and I was just like, oh, I don't want to live in Calgary anymore. I was kind of, I felt like I needed a change and. I was just wanted to go somewhere that I didn't know anything about it. So I, that's why I went to Toronto. Kind of like a not the best city, I guess, to go to if you're a professional snowboarder, obviously. But um, that's, like, I chose just to go there just to be in a new city that I knew nothing about. You ever bump into Drake out there? Mm, no. no. I'm sure I have seen him once. I have, have seen him once, yeah. Nice. You in the rock, streets? Rock with Ovio? Or? Do I rock with Ovio? Yeah. In what sense? Like, like do, do you do you rep the owl or I don't necessarily rep the owl, but uh, yeah, sure, I rock with Ovio. Okay. <laughs> what, what about Beebs? You ever seen Beebs out there? Ever seen Beebs? Damn, that'd be pretty fresh. Dude, I seen Beebs here. You saw Beebs in oh, Salt yeah. Lake City? Oh yeah, driving up the canyon. He was doing a shoot on the side of the road, uh, like, and I saw it on his gram later. We pulled over and really yeah. up up to Brighton. Yeah, up to Brighton, right where. The over sick overview spot, I can almost the imagine. Overview, it. it's not the S turn, but below, or yeah, below yeah, where above, that, right above it, kind of chokes thing. out. It chokes out like where you drive through that narrow yep. section. Yeah, that's oh. the spot. So when we were at the Airbnb, you were mentioning that you kind of said, like, you don't necessarily relate to snowboarders. Like, you like snowboarding, but you don't necessarily like your your circle of friends isn't all just like boarders, right? Yeah, not necessarily, but I think, I think more so now I do relate to like. The, I feel like snowboarding kind of had a transitional period as well where 
it's becoming more interesting again and there's people from different walks of life and it's becoming more inclusive where like for a while there I was skating and snowboarding a lot at the same time and I was just yeah I didn't really I guess vibe with a lot of snowboarders that I was meeting and I was getting along more so with the people I was meeting skateboarding and it just found them to be maybe more interesting or I could relate to them more at that time of my life but now like yeah some of my closest friends are snowboarders like Kuzik and like I meet, I've met so many amazing people snowboarding as well, so I can't really say that I don't relate to them. I just think that, I think I do now. I think there's, it's just changed a little bit. I think, obviously, um, things like this podcast help that a lot, and I don't know, snowboarding's just changing. It's becoming more inclusive. Mm-hmm. And uh, The torment stuff's helping that a lot when you yeah. see, you know, and, and bringing in different races and Every, every, it's all good that like making it very clear that it's all good that like yo you're gay cool come hang come kick it like yeah. come on in where it maybe wasn't like that for a while just Dude, definitely cookie not. cutter yeah it's just definitely a cookie cutter and it's like it is unfortunately a sport that costs a lot of money to do so to even start snowboarding it is um it's a difficult feat to even <coughs> be able to get gather the gear and go to a mountain so that kind of excludes a majority the majority of people really whereas something with like skateboarding you just need that one skateboard that can last you quite a while and you can just go outside and do it it's not as wild but i would i don't know we were talking about this as well but something that i'd really like to figure out is i know there's stuff like the burton chill program and uh ojo foundation and there's more things popping up but i would love to figure out a way to just continue to start giving people the opportunity to get into snowboarding because I don't know. I just think it would be, make it far more interesting and yeah. I I just, I guess for a while there, I just wasn't like as proud to be a snowboarder. It just felt, I wasn't really like vibing with the people that are running companies and like, I'd hear people say fucked up things and I would just hang out. I mean, I was obviously close with you, and, like, I had my group of friends at Snowboard, but as a whole, I was, when I'd go to a trade show or something, I'd be like, I don't really, like, fuck with this. Trade shows can be a little overwhelming. Yeah, and so it was just kind of unmotivating at times. And there's some people that just live for the trade show, too, and that yeah. demotivates you a bit to yeah. be there. You're just like, yeah. Wow. Just cross-eyed, like, throwing up the horns, <laughs> yeah. just, like, hot beer breath in your mouth, like, And they have spitting to touch on you your... and shake your hand, yeah. and it's just like, ah. Yeah. I am not rocking with that scene. It gets intense. Well, I hope you figure out one of the a way to do that because yeah. we those love, foundations those, that those are that are dope. And also, sidebar, as you're talking, Sorry like to make all this noise right now. No, all good. Yeah. Your your the shit your mom's got going on with, and your brother with riders on board. It's like that's a that's another you know it's different, but it's a cool thing. No, for sure. And I think that I think there is a way. And I think we're going to hopefully see that in the future of companies coming together and trying to figure out a way to help underprivileged people have access to it because there's no reason that we can't. Like, I know it obviously costs a lot of money to run resorts. It, gear costs a lot of money, but it's like if we... <clears throat> that sounds so corny, but like if people who are in places of power like come together, like, like we... I was saying this the other day too. It's like definitely the person... Like, we haven't seen the best snowboarder because they probably don't have access to, to be able to do it. And it's like, that's a lot of like wasted talent and a lot of even that aside, it's like just an awesome, it's a fun fucking thing. You're in the mountains. You're like with your friends, you're riding down the mountain on a piece of wood. Like, it's like you can have, it's so powerful and it's just like a fun fucking thing to do that a lot of people don't even get the opportunity to do ever in their life. And that one time getting a kid up yeah. there could be what makes him go back and be like, man, I need to raise money and figure this out. And, and that's like such smoke. a little part of it too, is like the actual act. And then you start getting into like, oh, there's like video parts. There's like yeah, all the this culture. music and it's like. Yeah, get him hooked in. You know, it's really cool. Randomly, uh, Patrick Chung's a, a, a football player for the New England Patriots. And um, randomly found out he's super into snowboarding. That's you know? cool. And you, I think. You know, it's it's a weird one for me. Me and Buds to talk about. We're two white dudes, you know. But like, I think naturally, you know, you need somebody. You stick to what is comfortable, like in your 
culture or around you or your, what your family, or your parents, or your friends do. And so, like, it's sick when you have, you know, you're getting black people like Zeb or whoever's involved. Then, yeah. then you, you know, maybe some people in that community are like, oh, he looks like me. I can do this. I didn't even know I could do this. You know, like you're saying, you need to get other people from different cultures in and to be like, to just for people's light bulbs to go off, be like, oh, shit, all right, I'm down, let's do this. You and, know? like, I don't want to be a part of, like, some country club shit. Yeah, like, true. I don't, I'm not attracted to that. Like, I don't want to be a part of, like, some exclusive fucking thing that is, like, stagnant and boring and, like, no flavor. Like, fuck that. Like, I want everyone to have a chance to do it. And, like, it's hard. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's really hard to figure out how we figure out how to do that because it isn't such an expensive thing but i i think there there has to be a way that we can figure it out yeah companies maybe i know even 686 does a program where they bring kids up from la downtown la up to big bear once a year it's so sick and if more brands started do, just doing that that's i think that's all it takes you know those inner city kids that never have seen snow all of a sudden are up there fully outfitted with everything they need. So fresh. Yeah. And if you're from a city like Calgary or you grew up on the East Coast or anywhere with small hills, I feel like the the backyard aspect is how I got into it. It's like you you start where you don't – I didn't go to the resort. I would start sledding, and then you're like, oh, shit, I'm going to cop a black snow plastic. You hit the golf course. And then hit the golf course jump. And then, like, you know, I was, like, learning 360s at the golf course before I even learned how to go down the hill. Yeah, same here. And so that's kind of like – I don't know, maybe, maybe the resort's – just off the top of my head, maybe with like cities need municipal hills that are like lean for towards sure. that, like you know, where it's free. That would be cool, dude. I, Calgary needs something like that, and that's something that I've talked about with my brother, and like, so, and like, it's something I would like to try to figure out. Like, you look at Minneapolis or the Twin Cities, and there's so many of those little hills that can't be that expensive to run. Yeah, and look at the fucking product that comes out of there. Yes, yeah, so many good kids. Is COP expensive? Or like, and it's just like, I mean, I'm super grateful for COP because it was there. And it's but close. At the same time, it's like, wasn't the people who ran it and stuff weren't like sick and mm. it wasn't that, I don't know. They, there's definitely room for somewhere. Something cooler. Something better. So let's jump back into uh, board career stuff because along the lines of filming all those video grass parts, eventually Nike comes along. And Nike's like, we're going to fucking put our stake in snowboarding. We're going to get all the best dudes. We're going to pay them a shitload of money, and we're going to sign Latex Manch. <laughs> what was the vibe when that uh, Connie got signed? The vibe, like my personal vibe? Yeah, just like, that must have been huge, getting signed by Nike, right? Yeah, it was really fucking cool. Like, nothing bad to say about that whole situation. It was awesome. I kind of want to talk more about, like, Bisque, and, like, those guys were, like, flying first class. Is that true? I never flew first class. Oh, I think shit. that was, like, before my time. Yeah. But you didn't go on that Russia trip with everybody, no. okay? Because I think they flew first class to Russia. And Dude, we need to get back to that. Back to those. <laughs> we need to get back to <laughs> get back first to the class. Bisque. Yeah, back to the bisque. Right? I'm back in first a class thirty. Is pretty expensive. I'm more like thirty nine B. Like oh yeah, yeah. forty eight fucking middle whatever 50, the middle is fifty seven D. <laughs> middle stuck between like the worst people. It's both sleeping. At least with COVID, yeah. you can't have people sitting next yeah, to you. Nice. That's a good thing for flying. Are we allowed to talk about um, Nike Bisque by chance? Dude, I don't even know. You don't know how much Bisque? I know. Do you? How Roughly. do you know and he doesn't know? I asked Hava because Hava worked at Nike. How do you he, not he said, know? He said somewhere right around six figures. Is six figures like 100 Gs? Yes. I think it was less than that, but like it was up there. Maybe with yeah. the incentives? Maybe with, probably with incentives. How yeah. do you not know? Bro, I was like, I was still fucking mad young when I was even on Nike. Mm -hmm. And like, I never like... I've never really fucking spent any of my money. Oh, really? Like, I don't really, I mean, like, I spend money to, like, live. Yeah. But I definitely haven't been, like, lavish. Me and my brother bought a so house. So you have, like, a vault, like, Scrooge McDuck Does that you, you just McDuck swim vault? around in? No, no McDuck, McDuck <laughs> vault. But, like, <laughs> I just, like. I, I just, I'd like to go swimming in there if you have that. No, All like, the pennies <laughs> spitting them out of his mouth? Like, the biggest purchase is, like, my brother and I bought a house in Calgary during that time. Since then, like, I mean, you spend money fucking paying rent and yeah. eating and shit. But like, it adds up. And, like, I try to invest my money. I'm just like, yeah, I'm not. I think I would love to buy another. I'd love to own a property again. But um, oh, you don't have one anymore? I mean, me and my brother have one. You rent I, out? He, he, he lives there. Oh, sick. 
But so yeah, I haven't I haven't really like bought like whips or like fucking. I don't know. Anything. You just squirrels yeah. it away. I haven't really bought anything that cool. I actually just bought a car, but was, I bought a '97 Forerunner. Pretty sick. Damn, dude. baller. Yeah. That's dope. But that's, that's like cool. Not that much money. So <laughs> yeah, that can't be too much. '97. I think about a lot of this stuff too when you get a fat contract and you're on Nike and there's usually big expectation with that. Did you feel like, all right, I'm on Nike, I got I got big shoes to fill, or are you just like I'm doing me? I didn't even look at Nike in that way. Like I look back now and I'm like, fuck, like I didn't even I should have taken I should have got like some fresh gear and like kicks. Like I was like skating I like asked for like Janowski's. And now I'm like I should have just asked for like some rare dunks and like I didn't know anything about Dude, those rare stuff. dunks are worth so much money. Yeah, I didn't know anything about I was just like, oh, sick. Like, Nike's, this is dope. Like, everyone's nice. Like, I get to, like, <laughs> <laughs> go, everyone's pretty nice. Go to do the shit. Went to Beaverton, went to Nike, the Nike place. The, uh, what do they call it? The Nike Town or whatever. I don't even know. It's the campus. The, the campus. campus. That's yeah. what they call it. I don't know. It was sick. I was with, like, and a cool team, like Benny and Dirks. Or was, yeah, Dirks was on. Nicholas Mueller, Mueller. Austin Smith, Justin Benny. We're going to give Benny an air horn. Um, well, while we're on this, this subject of board career, because there's it's a there's like you kind of broke down earlier in the kitchen. There's like three phases of Jed, right? So you have you have the early bobblehead Jed, Jed on the across the helmet. Then you got the Burton Forum Jed. And then you have, so then phase two is like video grass Jed, video part guy, beat down rail god. Uh, we'll call, call him that. And so, so kind of end of phase two, you filmed like, I don't know how many video parts, online projects, just, just beat shit down. But eventually you had something happen with your sponsors and stuff. You want to just explain what happened and that whole period of your life after and everything? Sure. Yeah. So I was on Nike and Solomon for that a po- pretty decent portion of that uh, chapter of my career. And... Nike decided to pull out of snowboarding. I think probably money reasons. Um, maybe they weren't getting the return that they expected or whatever. And it was, I mean, I, it sucks that it ended, but like the whole time was chill and they carried out our contracts to the end. Like they could have been like, we're done. So it was sick. That was just something that happened and I was still on Solomon, so I wasn't really tripping. And then. That contract came up, and <laughs> they're like, "We're not gonna resign you." And I was like, what "The fuck!" Like, because I've been getting, yeah, like you said, like last part. I think I had a the year that they dropped me. I had snowboarder cover and interview, and last part, and yeah, they dropped me. So I was kind of just left in this position, like I kind of like looked for sponsors and kind of like a harsh time to be looking for sponsors, I guess, in the industry. Never really found anything, and it was just kind of like, all right, I guess that I'm just not going to snowboard anymore. Because I went from, yeah, obviously making a living, and then just to have zero support. Obviously, I had money saved up, but I was getting to an age, mid-20s, where I'm like, okay, like I need a job, or like I can't really just like go do this for fun. So yeah, I just stopped snowboarding at that time. Rail God to just stop snowboarding. And one thing before we get into what you were doing and all that, I noticed that when you walked away, there's like you just see comments or hear people say shit, and there was like kind of this. Maybe you said in an interview after the fact about how like if you're you know basically you allotted the fact like if I'm not being paid, I'm not gonna do this right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. can you just explain? Because, like, out of context, there's so many people that are like, I would fucking kill for that opportunity, or I would do this. But I, I would love to just, like, fuck those people up right now because they're kind of... <laughs> if we're giving them a sense of perspective of why that... Like, why you did that. Like we touched on earlier, it's like filming a video part is a lot of work, and if you're trying to push snowboarding and yourself and risking your health, it's not really comparable to just snowboarding for fun. Um and when you've been living that way and you've been, I put in a lot of work. I was, I, and I still am trying to build my legacy. And I, I have peers that I look up to that have these legacies and I'm still working toward that. But I have, 
I had done a lot by that point. I had been on Nike. I had filmed fo- video every year of video part, and like a lot of times last part, getting a lot of photos and stuff. So it's like I'm not just gonna like go and make that risk. And I've had injuries throughout the year. I've hit my head. Like I've hurt myself. And it's like to me, it's not worth it. It's not worth my health. And it's I have to have self respect for myself too. To say like okay like I'm not gonna just do what I've been doing I've been getting paid these companies are benefiting from this we're marketing tools at the end of the day um, that's why they pay us like to make a to make them look a certain way or to give them um, I don't know Credi- credibility, credibility. Yep. Mm-hmm. yeah so I don't know it just didn't it didn't make sense for me to go and do that for free or go and do that for a very minuscule amount of money for when I know someone else is going to benefit off of the risk of my health and my hard work. It's like, I don't know. Like I said, I was like 25 or 26. It's like, I'm not that young. Like I need to figure some other shit out then because I need to fucking pay bills and I have rent. I have to be able to live. Yeah. You didn't even go free ride at sunshine or anything. I was living in Toronto at that point. Yeah. So you're far from mountains. Yeah. So I wasn't even like, like, I was still snowboarding when I moved to Toronto, and I was still on Solomon yeah. stuff. Yeah, Toronto does not have resort clothes. No, but it's like, and yeah. I didn't have a car there. And none street my, boarding's not the same as just going and taking some turns at a resort. Exactly. Yeah. And, like, I didn't, none of my friends there snowboarded or had stopped snowboarding because they couldn't afford it. Yeah. So. That makes sense to me. I was just like, all right, I'm just not going to, like, do this for a bit. And I felt, like, unmotivated. I'm like, okay, I've literally been doing my job pretty fucking good I felt like I mean I'm sure that I there was times where I, it was hard to work with um so then I'm like okay well fuck this I just felt like it was a slap in the face a bit and so I was just like pretty over it yeah, if you like, have an interview and covers well, from, from my enders if yeah. from my perspective I, I was just like yeah I get it Jed de- Jed deserves to be paid to go snowboarding he deserves to he, like he's earned that and the thing is, like, when people say that, it's like, well, you're not doing what Jed does. Like, Jed is going to this maybe a notable kink rail that everybody's seen, and he's going to do the hardest trick that's ever been done on that. He's going to do the hardest trick that's ever been done. If there's, It's not like, oh, he quit snoring. He did. Like, the tricks you're doing, you deserve to be paid for. You, you don't just go cab two back lip a fucking kink rail for fun. That's not fun. Yeah. That's like, hey, I'm here to fuck shit up and, like, let people know. Who the big dog is. And it, and it's like these people, a lot of these people that are saying that are, yeah, they're filming, They're also, maybe they're also filming these video parts, but their goal is to get paid and be a professional snowboarder. It's like I already proved that. Like I already, at that point I probably filmed like eight video parts. You've done the work. And like had a handful of interviews and like three or four covers. It's like. If companies are, like you said, if companies are going to be making money off of having you on the team, you're not going to do it for peanuts. Like. There's no point. Like, hey, yeah. you want me to come on your team and sell a bunch of snowboards? Like, whatever team you go to is going to sell a bunch of snowboards because you're on that team. And like I said earlier, it's like health is everything. I'm not going to risk I'm not going to risk my health. Like, it's not worth it. It's just straight up not worth it, especially at that age, mid-20s. It's like, if I'm not getting paid, if I'm not making a living doing this, it's like, I should go do some other shit because, like, it's just not smart. Like, I can't. I can't jeopardize that for nothing. So, and I want to. I want to feel respected too. Yeah, it's a self respect. Like I, I know what I'm worth, and I, I ain't doing this shit for free. And that's yeah. yeah that's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, fuck no, there's not. And I think a lot of people kind of maybe read that the wrong way, but I think it. I don't think it's a fucking hard thing to wrap your head around. <laughs> 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 I don't. It's <laughs> uh, a great point, Chad. I think you're right. Especially, yeah, you got to look to your future, too. You can't just be out there, especially if you hit your head before. I mean, geez. One thing if you're 17 years old. Yeah, if you're 17, you're like, is doing different. This, but when you're in your, you got to pay your bills and snowboarding. Ain't Life gets real in your Life mid-20s. Gets real. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have said that shit, is, they maybe never have been doing it as a job. No, it's exactly. Different. I think that's probably it's exactly fucking different. It. It's yeah. not. It's not the same as just going and snowboarding. It's, no. There's a lot of pressure. A lot more and there's it. a lot of pressure you put on yourself. And it might not be said, but with those big contracts comes big expectation too. Of course. Like, 
all right, like people always say, that, oh, I want that deal. I want that deal. Okay, well, when you get that deal, are you going to deliver what's expected mm-hmm. of you from the brands? Are you supposed to use your own money to get out of Toronto to go on these trips to make yeah, shit happen? Wh- you know, and like, like for it's what? Expensive. Do I have, it felt, what it felt like if I were to do that, it's like, I'm trying to film another part to get sponsored. It's like, I've already filmed like. Been there, done that. It's like, if I'm not, if people don't want to sponsor me off of like what I've already done, then like, I, what am I going to do? I, I don't know. Your I just resume say, just, is already there. Right? Yeah, like I already yeah. had the resume. I'm like, I don't want to have to go and pay for myself to like try to go a little bit harder to like hopefully like get a sponsor. I don't it know. just says something about where snowboarding was at the time, I guess, that yeah, you weren't just, able to get the sponsor. Yeah. Well, let's talk about at that point, you walk away from snowboarding and everybody was like, dude, where's Jed? You're kind of this like misty human. I hadn't, I wasn't like talking to you a lot. I just didn't hear a lot from you. Like, what were you doing in that period of, like, walking away from snowboarding? Trying to, basically what I said earlier was just trying to, like, be like, okay, what are my other options, like, if I'm not going to snowboard? Trying to figure it out. I had saved, like I said, I haven't really been one to spend a lot of my money, so I had a chunk of money to live off of for the time being. I don't know. It was kind of just like a, a it sounds corny, find yourself. I don't think that's what I was doing, but. I I was just confused because all I knew was snowboarding. I think I was just in limbo of like, am I going to go to school? Am I going to try to find a job? I was kind of dipping my toes in all sorts of shit. And I don't think it was like necessarily a healthy time for me, but it was a necessary time. And it definitely, when snowboarding did come back, it made me appreciate it in a different way. I was also dealing with, yeah, a lot of mental health issues um, prior to getting dropped by Solomon too which I think Solomon was frustrated with just maybe me I'm like they're like oh let's go on I mentioned this in this tournament interview a little bit but like like there's like a board test thing we need you to go on or something and like in the, that time it's like I'm in a really dark place and like I can't can't be around people but I'm also not comfortable how I am now with saying like I have these issues like I can't fucking come. So I would just be like, no, I'm not coming. And then that w- they would take that as like, Jed doesn't care about the brand. So like, I can see how it can be interpreted that way. Same point. It's like, I was fulfilling everything and beyond in my contract. So it was still a little confusing, but I also get, you want to work with people that are easy to work with. Maybe I wasn't the easiest person to work with. Well, and if they didn't understand why you weren't going, they maybe thought you were too cool to go support the brand in that way. Yeah. You only wanted to film your video parts, and you didn't want to be the team player. And and had they really known what was going on, it could have been different. It could have been different, maybe. Maybe. And but at the same time, it's like I'm doing everything that's in the fucking contract. Yeah, so, that's that's what's and I'm up. doing it. I'm getting all my incentives. Like, sorry that I'm not fucking going to like this board test, but I'm doing everything else like to the the best <laughs> yeah that I can do and it happens with other brands and other people it's like you mm-hmm. see it all the time they do everything to the best of your ability J2 used to always joke like do less because the second you do everything you're supposed to do your brand's just going to cut you mm-hmm. it's back when Burton used to do that to a lot of his friends back in the day but it's also yeah it's, it's, like, a, it's like yeah. a fucked up thing it's like this is a legal contract I'm going to do what's in it and you're meeting all the points and it's like, I'm not, I don't know. It's like people aren't going to work overtime in another job for free. True. They're not going to be like, oh, like, I'm going to just fucking do this. It's like, no. But I don't know. There's like different ways to look at it. Like yeah. now it's like I'm in a better place and I'm able to be more open with my sponsors and like I'm, and I fuck with my sponsors like heavy. So I want to like be a part of that more. Maybe I, I don't know. Dude, That's it's cool. different time. Dude, you know, it's an interesting thing. Like Jed and I shared a pro model through this whole time. A yeah. board called the Salamander. And so that was a strong board too, and, right? So when it happened, like it's just it was a weird I you know, I, I can't bite the hand that feeds me. I don't you know, you're, you're like in this thing, not to make it about myself, but it was it was a strange time for sure. You're like, wait, what? You know, what Yeah. But no hard feelings. But it ended up know. being a goddamn Cinderella story. Well yeah, it was the best probably like Well seeing you come back was pretty exciting and cool for snowboarding, you know. And I was excited too. Um I don't know, everything that's happened, like, with, like, the special blend form thing, and then, like, I needed that break to kind of figure some shit out, and then I came back, and then, like, I think I just needed that 
again to kind of like come back confident and excited and so at during the time i'm like this fucking sucks like i'm not getting it i don't have an income anymore like i'm literally don't have a job i'm used to making money <laughs> did you go work any shitty jobs i don't know i didn't well, i did i did like money free, saved I, I did freelance shit like and i still do i um kind of got into like graphic design and that's dope working with some other brands um and yeah, it, it was st- it was still overall like I think a really positive thing that happened. And it's funny how uh, most things in my life that at the time seem like these drastic negative changes are usually for the best. Yeah, because now the, the now fact that you're good. able to to see that is a m- huge huge mark of growth. Like the this thing that seems the most devastating worst thing happened. Be like I heard you say it earlier. Like this that might have been one of the better things that happened to me. And finding that because it's it's hard to do that and it and. Uh, because the way, you know, you went through, you you had that period where you're, like, kind of depressed and lost and figuring it out. And I heard you were living at Danny Cass's house? That was, like, pre... I w- that was, like, pre-Toronto. Oh, that was but pre-Toronto. Yeah. Oh, that was in New York City when you were doing... There's a phase in your... Well, let, let's just... Can we just touch on randomly living at Danny Cass's yeah, condo for a little bit? <laughs> Dude, I don't even... I don't know exactly what year that was, but I think I just ran into Danny, like, doing some Nike shit. I think I expressed some interest in coming to New York for a period of time. And he's like, I have a house there or like I have a condo there, like that I'm never at if you want to rent it or something. And I hit him up and I ended up renting it for like a month and a half in the city. In the, it was in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Yeah. That must've been a pretty cool time. Yeah, it was cool. It was just like off the L train, just like just into Brooklyn. Graham Ave on the L. And you were doing art school or some shit at that time. I did. T- I went to uh, the art school there for like a fucking month, but like that was like, Dude, I think that I was like nineteen or twenty because that's like right when I started really dealing with the mental health shit, and I just like wasn't in a place to be going to school at all and living in an unfamiliar place. But it was still, a, yeah, really fucking <laughs> weird time living there. His house was like really wild, like art, weird art and shit. I came down one day, Brains for Franskis, just sleeping on the couch. Like I was there alone. <laughs> And I came down, like, oh, Braden Serfransky, like, on the couch. Like, I thought I was renting this place for a month. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, oh, just go stay in. Yeah, yeah. But it was pretty funny. Yeah. But he's just all, Danny said I could crash Yeah, he's just like, Danny, I just hit up Danny, I'm going to stay here for the weekend. I was like, word. Like, Did he give you, like, Braden. a good deal on this sick place? Because New York's pretty expensive. I think it was, like, a G or something. <laughs> yeah. For, like, that, showing for up. that place was, like. Yeah, probably a deal, huh? Yeah, definitely. That's cool. Dude, well, I got another guest question, and this one's from uh, Hava Fernandez, who got us both on Salmon and been a big uh, part of both of our lives. And um, randomly, before I get into this guest question, I want to tell this quick story about Hava because he's one of the funnier stories I've ever had. When we were on Salmon, there used to be a travel agency back in the day. <laughs> okay. That would book all of our tickets. And you'd be like, hey, I need to fly to like Calgary for this rail trip. He'd be like, okay, hold on. Let me get another Salmon travel agent on the phone. And there'd be these three-way calls. So there'd be, like, myself, Hava, travel agent, who was a woman. I don't know her name. God bless her soul. But I remember one point Hava was booking a plane ticket for me, and he wanted to just fuck with, I think, me and the travel agent. So he started clearing his throat, like, mid-conversation. So she'd be like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, do you want to sit aisle? And he'd be like, <clears throat> and you'd be like, and I knew what he was doing. And he'd be like, do you want aisle or backseat? Ha! Hmm! Ha! <laughs> And then, like, and then she'd be, like, asking all these, so what's your birthday? And ah! he's like sorry, <laughs> like, sorry, I have something stuck in my throat. Ah! 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 And I'm, like, sitting there, and I remember, like, I had tears. I couldn't talk because, like, Hava would do this thing where he'd clear his throat randomly, like, sorry, I'm just, ha! Ah! Ha! Ah! And, like, <laughs> anyway, I like, couldn't even talk to this poor travel agent lady, but that was fucking fun times traveling with that guy. Uh, and now we have a guest question presented by Solomon from none other than Hava Fernandez. Here we go. Hello, bombhole. Hava Fernandez here. <clears throat> Jed, <laughs> curious. <laughs> what is particularly difficult for you on a snowboard? I had a front row seat to watch you do it for a really long time, and it didn't seem like there was much of anything, although I'm sure there's something. Anyways, love you guys. Thank you for uh, always making me look like I knew what I was doing out there, even though we both know I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Fuck me. Anyways, <laughs> love you guys. Talk to you soon. 
<laughs> you get Hava's humor there a little bit. That's that. awesome. A little taste of humor. <laughs> of Hava's humor. What's hard for me snowboarding? Fucking a lot. Grabbing melon is really hard. Grabbing Japan is really hard. Anything front hand behind the bindings is really hard for me. Um, fucking you get short arms? I don't fucking know. I can <laughs> grab backhand fine. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably just getting stiffer too. And then also, yeah, thank those for the kind words with that too, Hava. But um, I don't know, like a lot of shit. I think like a lot of I know I've heard the, on the podcast you talk about a lot about like people who aren't like naturally talented, and there's people who are naturally talented, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like I think that's true, but and I think like a lot of times people like say that about me. They're like, oh, he's like really like naturally talented and like like I I work pretty fucking hard though like I was so obsessed with snowboarding as a young kid like the amount of hours that I put in was just, like ruthless I think so <laughs> I don't know there's still a lot that's like hard good, he's got good so fundies he's got it. good fundy mentors yeah. good fundies yeah you got but, good fundies you can do whatever well, I think what Andy Wright was trying to say when he said you were lazy is that you're really naturally talented so you can be lazy but it sounds like you put in the work early and no one just nobody saw it. I, Maybe. I do have to say, Jed, though, like, all right, I know that you learned all your shit at a young age and you worked super hard, but, like, I've been skating with you before where you're, like, you just, I remember skating high cascades specifically, and I think you just, you'd never done a frontside flip, and then you just did one, you just tried one, did it, and then you could just frontside flip. Like, it was, it was, I've seen you learn shit at a, at a great rate, at a faster rate than the average. Maybe. I don't know. That's really nice. <laughs> I, I don't fucking know. Skating's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> He's got some humble points going right now. But no, I I, I mean... I don't want to be annoyingly humble, but either, though. That shit is fucking annoying when you no. are. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't fucking know. It's, yeah, it's a weird topic. But yeah, you know, it's a good point to say that, like, oh, that guy's talented. Well, yeah, he put in all the work when he's a kid. So, like, it's not necessarily... He just got really good when he was, like, a bobblehead. So... But at the end of the day, like, my buddy's a, a snowboard coach, uh, Pops, and he was saying, he's just like, you know, you take all these kids at the same age and ability level, and he's like, some people, they just got it. Like, that's that's a thing. Like, you know, some people are more coordinated than other people. Yeah. That's a fact, yeah. You know? But hard work is a definitely a determining factor. Hunger, too. Oh, drive. Yeah, drive. That's it. That's the main factor. Drive. <laughs> Listen, we need to talk about Wild Mics. The fact is, they are a sponsor. And you signed a contract guaranteeing them certain concessions. One of them being spot on the show. Well, that's where I see things just a little differently. Contract or no, I will not bow to any sponsor. I'm sorry you feel that way. But basically, it's the nature of the beast. Maybe I'm wrong on this one, but for me... The beast doesn't include selling out. Mmm. Stoney, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's like people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. I can't talk about it anymore. It's giving me a headache. Here, drink one of these. The bomb hole. Banter. Edgy. Cheddar Biscuits. Look, you can stay here in the big leagues and play by their rules, or you can go back to the farm club. It's your choice. Yes, and it's the choice of a bomb hole generation. <sighs> so uh, I'm going to have a Patreon question for you from Aiden Newsom. He wants to know about your art. How did you get into it, and what mediums are you into using? Um. Okay. I mean, I've always, like Chris said, I always kind of was drawing as a kid, too. Always had a sketchbook around and just always interested in drawing and paintings and stuff. And I'm just still, it's all just been a lot of trial and error for me. Um, I just like the feeling of creating something whether it's like a video part or a drawing or a painting, like I just get a lot of satisfaction from that. Just having 
maybe not even having an idea, but just like like I made this shit. Like I don't know. I just really like that feeling. But um, as far as mediums go, I've pretty much just try to f- fuck around with like. Lately, it's been a lot of like pencil crayons and acrylic painting, but also uh, messing around with like uh, my printer and doing scanning and stuff like that. That's also the exciting part about um, making images or whether it's a painting or a drawing or whatever. It's kind of never ending. So, does that pretty much answer the yeah, show? Yeah, that's a great. Have answer. you always made your own board graphics and all that? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm psyched. Like, it's really cool to have a collection of them. Like, I saw in Chris's house, like, he also has a collection of them. But, um, I don't know. I always liked when, like, growing up when people, I knew people made their own graphics. And I, if I liked them as a snowboarder or a skateboarder, it just made it a little, way that better. much more special. More interesting. To get that, yeah. like, I'm like, this is, like, their pro model. Like, they designed it or what. I don't know. It's just cool. I agree. It makes yeah. it that much cooler. And you get to look into the mind of that person mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Now, uh, earlier we had a question from Hava Fernandez, and he sent me two. I didn't end up uploading this other guest question, but he also had a question that was basically, what gives you satisfaction is essentially what he asked. That's an insanely broad question. <laughs> that's, is, why, that's why we didn't go with it. But. Is he talking snowboarding yeah, or I think life? life? Snowboarding. Probably both. Yeah, like how do, you, how do you get a sense of satisfaction in the world? Like what, what, yeah, life. He probably means life at this stage in yeah, Hava's life. I would say life. Making the people I care about like happy gives me a lot of satisfaction. And uh, like treating myself and other people properly. And also with snowboarding and in life, like I said, with art too, it's like uh, starting doing something from start to finish and having that finished product is super satisfying. Or And also with snowboarding, scaring yourself and getting over that fear and getting the clip is like the best. Clip addict. Clip fiends. Yeah. Clip high. Mm-hmm. That's, sick. This is a, that's a phenomenal answer. I love that. And that's a, that's another thing, you know, this is a different rabbit hole. Who knows where it'll go. But you think about what a video, what a, when you film a trick and you save it for this video part, this segment, and there's this broader picture of I want it to all come together in this certain way, like the way in the way you do with the song. It's what essentially it is is it's prolonged gratification, right? And and in this world, we're in the world of instant gratification. Fuck, give me the clip. I'm gonna throw that shit on the gram. And it's like, what yeah, do you? What are your are thoughts on give me the clip, throw it on the gram versus the prolonged gratification of like? I'm building a little masterpiece here. I mean, I think a video part is timeless. I think that there's a way to do it and a way that it's been done and there's a formula. Whether it's a year or two years or whatever, it's just special. It's like you take the times to... It's Nothing is ever going to beat that. Like a single clip is going to get lost on the internet, on Instagram. You have a video part that you put that much effort into can't be beat in my opinion i think it's important i think it's the like standard that you have to hold yourself to i don't i hope it doesn't ever go away i think like it to be a professional snowboarder unless you're like a contest dude it's like you have to be able to film a video part a good video part like i don't care about one clip it's like you have to be able to deal with all the shit and like all the trials all the work that you put in filming that video part like i don't i don't know i think that's like a good test of like to see if someone deserves to be professional snowboarder in my opinion and i agree and that kid that puts out that one clip he's almost shooting himself in the foot yeah for sure because yeah, hold on to that shit for, film for like a day people are hyped <laughs> yeah film like fucking 15 more clips make it memorable yeah but it is hard it's like i don't know I get that feeling too sometimes when I post something on Instagram, even if it's not snowboarding or whatever, and you're like, damn, this thing's like getting a lot of likes. It's like, what the fuck am I talking about? But, yeah. Like, but that shit feels good. I don't know. True. It's just, it's just a like. Dopamine hit. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know. It's, yeah. Good feeling. Well, well on the subject of a uh, of video part stuff, one thing that's non snowboarding related is uh, the blue, t- is it the blue tile video? Is that what it's called? The baby blue? Okay, yeah. You filmed a part for that, mm-hmm. which is probably your most notable skate part. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's fucking incredible. 
And in that, you did pro skateboard caliber maneuvers. Uh, one of them being like board sliding that big ass fucking kink. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, dude. That's fucking sick. How hyped are you on that? And how was that whole process of board sliding that hog and all those clips? I wouldn't say it's professional level skateboarding at all, but it was, it, it was just the same as filming a snowboard part. It, I love filming skating too. It's just different. It's like I know my levels are different with them, but it's like it's like skating is fucking gnarly. It's hard and like I think snowboarding is easier for myself for me than skating is. But that I mean, I was really psyched to just film a video like a skateboard video part. It was just really cool to be able to do and air horn for blue tile. Yeah, that video is sick. Like Rob and Rich and Mike and everyone, Sean who work there and help out with the shop, like they're the best. Like I, I get all my boxes sent there and I have a little section with my snowboard shit. And I don't know, those dudes are fucking the best. I don't know. If like from moving to Toronto, like those they all open like welcome me with open arms, you know? So it's cool to be a part of a shop like that. And they have such an amazing legacy. It's pretty cool as uh for us as like snowboard like I'm a snowboard skateboarder, but it's like purely recreational. It's like a I don't it whatever. But then seeing you out there on the same like you're out there with in the same video with the most respected dudes in Toronto. And it's gotta be cool to be on that level with those dudes, huh? Even though they're they're your homies maybe, but tough. No, yeah, it's fucking really cool. It's awesome. We were making, this is a bit of a side note, but just a pretty funny little story. Um, So Spitfire was making this clip. They wanted to make like a Canada kind of clip and they got Jake to do it, Kuzik. So we were out in Montreal. It was me and Jake were going there to film initially and then like with like some of our friends. But it was like the same time as like the Dime Glory Challenge. So at one point it was just like me and Jake... And then like Alyssa Steamer and Brad Cromer. And then those, they all had to go to the airport and they just left me and Jake with like the van to like go film. And we were just like, look at each other like, what the fuck? This is like, in, this is so crazy. Like <laughs> we're just in, oh, me and Jake have the Spitfire van to go skate. <laughs> like how did this happen? Like we were just both laughing. Like this is ridiculous. I don't know how this ever happened, but just, just a funny little yeah, off, it's incredible. That. It's incredible. I think ninety percent of snowboarders like love skating. So to like get peel the curtain back on any of that stuff, man, it's just cool. Yeah. It's cool. And you gotta put so much and it's like think about the people that are out there that are professional. They have like they go all winter, they skate all winter. It's like you got fifty percent of the time, maybe like forty percent, you know. I don't know. But you I, know what you you purely love it more. It's a in some senses. Yeah. I I don't even know if I like skating more than snowboarding anymore. Like, I definitely used to say that. But I come to the realization that I don't think they're really even comparable. Like, they're so fucking different than one another. Like, I don't even think you can compare them. I think they're both awesome. It's nice with skating where you don't have the anxiety of expectation from anybody to do anything. That's what makes yeah, skating maybe more therapeutic because you're like, nobody expects me to be good at this thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, the thing that I think if you're going to, you know, if we're going to talk about this is that i just love catching air on a snowboard that's the one thing that makes it like you can go fast as fuck snowboarding it's so cool Mm -hmm. and something i didn't appreciate as a younger person and especially going back being on this trip and being in the mountains being in the middle of nowhere it's like you ride a snowmobile where you hike way out into these mountains and you're just like with four of your friends in the middle of like that's a pretty wild feeling and something I never really paid attention to when I was younger. But I've, I appreciate things like that about snowboarding now that I didn't th- ever think about before. So you took your break from snowboarding, and then you were doing your thing, and then do you want to explain... A lot of people probably don't know about how you kind of like probably got an oppor- the opportunity and the secret filming of the video part and all that stuff. Mm. So yeah, I think I stopped snowboarding for two or three years, and... At the beginning of that, I was trying, I was, there was talk of maybe being able to get on Adidas. Um, Because Evan, who, Evan Lafibra, give him my air horn, worked at Adidas. And uh, 
I knew him from just our group of friends, skeleton crew, everything like that. So I tried to get on at that point and wasn't happening and kind of just fizzled out. Like they kind of were like, there might be some opportunity. Like, I don't know. Never ended up happening. Kind of forgot about snowboarding. Like I honestly didn't think I was ever going to really snowboard again. And then two years down the line, I, Wiz Alex Sherman Airhorn, of course, got a job at Adidas. Alex, or uh, sorry, Evan is still there, and they hit me up and they're like, "I think that we can make it happen now if you want to try to like start snowboarding again." And it was such like a sidelined idea for me at that point. Like I, I felt so separated from it, and I, I don't know, wasn't really ever thinking that that was gonna happen. And it took me maybe a couple of weeks to think about it. And I was like, I don't know, watching videos and stuff. And I was like, fuck, I should just try. See, like, what's good. Like, see if I can, I don't know. It seems like a pretty cool opportunity. And then, yeah, just went on it. The first trip we went on was to Montreal. It was me. I think it, was it just me and Wiz? I snowboard with Dylan, Ojo. Mm -hmm. And... Was anyone else there? I'm trying to think. I think it was just me, Wiz, and Dylan snowboarding. Wiz got clips on that trip. Really sick clips. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Shout out to Dylan, obviously. Of yeah, big air Rest horn. in peace. Rest in peace still. Um, yeah, sorry, I got kind of side sidetracked. But, no, it was really cool. It was, like, that was a really awesome trip. And I think the vibe was just right, like, with Dylan and Alex and everyone's like, fuck yeah, like, we're gonna, like, like you're gonna snowboard again. And it just felt right. It just felt right again. How and did it, how was it getting into the boarding again? Like, hadn't really strapped in for a couple of years. Like, were you, were you rusty or was the shit, like, working? Dude, somehow it, I wasn't that rusty. Like, I, the first, it's, I think it's in the part, I, like, switch board slid, like, a double king elbow drill. Yeah, I know the strap, yeah. That was the first thing that I, like, hit. I don't know, I've been skating so much, too, though, so I was, like, it kind of, I think I was just like, oh yeah, it feels like the same. I think I rode down like a hill or something. It was like all laying around and maybe did like a back 180 or something. I was like. <laughs> just right to switch board. Yeah, two or three to years <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, then, yeah, then that was like a year or whatever that I was filming that part. And it was all, I don't know, it was super weird because they're like, we're going to keep it a secret. So like that shit was like mad weird because obviously people start asking, like, how have you been snowboarding? And I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, fuck i don't i don't know how to navigate this this is so, <laughs> so weird but also in my head i was like it would be kind of cool if like just no one knew and then i one day they just open up their computer and there's a new part and i think for a lot of people it was that yeah which is cool i don't know Dude, i don't know if i that, 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 no, that explain shit right? no, no you explained it great <laughs> uh, it's a confusing story no like it, that for the outsider i didn't hear about it till like maybe right before it came out and there's like I had talks of it or maybe, maybe a few months, but dude, it was fucking incredible. Like nobody hears from you for three years. You're off the radar. And then it wasn't just like, Oh, like he's dipping his toe back into the video part. It's like, Hey, I'm back. And I just fucked everybody up. Dude. <laughs> like that must've been, how was the response on your end from, from people? You know, that must've been crazy. It was super cool. It was amazing. Just like, Obviously, there's people, like, hating about, uh, on the money shit. And be like, he's only coming back for, like, money. And it's like, I guess, in a sense, like, I w I'm coming back for support, but I'm coming back because the company, like, it's respects me. <laughs> and, like, that's exactly how I felt from Adidas is, like, they wanted to support me, and in return, I want to support them. So, yeah, I don't know. And for the most part, yeah, people were were really supportive, and it was a pretty fucking cool feeling to, like, come back and it was sorry to backtrack a bit but snowboarding it just felt different it, it felt i felt more excited again it, i needed like the break i've been just filming video part after video part it's just like clockwork you know mm -hmm. not to say that it came easy like that but it just like was such a pattern it's like oh yeah in hood in the summer i go to hood and then Winter's gonna come around. I'm gonna film a video part, and it didn't. It just started to feel less special. So like when I came, when I didn't have that for a bit, and I came back, and I was like, I forget how this feels. Like I, I don't know. It was, it's like you lose a, a girlfriend or something gets taken away from you, and then you have this new appreciation mm -hmm. for it. 
the same thing. And I've heard that from like a lot of the close friends I've talked to of yours, of ours that, you know, prep preparing for this conversation they're they're like, everybody's just like Jed has a new appreciation for snowboarding, even you. And, um, you know, to, to really validate that statement, Kuzik told me a really cool story about how this year you're on a trip and you woke up at like three or four in the morning and like left the house and set up a spot and yeah. then came and woke everybody up and hit it at like six or something. Yeah. It's like, dude, Jed from 2013 or 15, you would, you ain't doing that. No. Like that's, that's new Jed, the like new appreciation Jed. Yeah. So you just couldn't sleep or what? Well, it was at a government building. Ah. Uh. And like had to hit it I at, went at the time. night before and set up most of it, and then I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was just thinking about it because I was scared too. And I was like, I was like, I don't think I put enough snow there. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm just gonna go fucking set it up proper. So I just went and set it up by and, yourself. Yeah, that's so sick. And then just came back and grabbed everyone, and did it. That's pretty rad. And like when you do shit like that, it, the clip feels so much better too. You're like, I don't know. It's worth it. It's so worth it. Do you think the Jed, like, let, let's say hypothetically this show existed a few years ago, like, do you feel like the Jed a few years ago would have come on this show or, like, been down? It's hard. I, it's hard to, like, go back into that mindset, but maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. It just seems like you love snowboarding now. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Which, like, back back for, before it didn't, it, it, it's like you, you love getting A grades, but maybe, like, riding Woodward wasn't your shit. But this is a conversation Jake queued up too. Um, he was basically saying that, like, you know, a person like yourself that suffers from mental, mentally being tormented at times, right? From number of things, like, like the the filming requires such a deep focus when you're working towards the video part and trying a really hard trick that it requires such a deep focus that sometimes going and riding the resort doesn't fill the void in the same way. No, oh, for sure. Can you like elaborate on that? I think I needed that intensity of being scared and all those emotions to like weirdly get that like enjoyment of getting the clip, which for that was where the enjoyment came from was getting the clip. When you're riding the resort, there's just a lot of time on the chairlift to think and like to dwell and your concentration doesn't need to be as intense. So I think when that stuff's not quiet, it's hard to be in the moment and enjoy really anything. So I think, yeah, that definitely took a, took away a lot of that shit that I enjoyed when I was younger. Yeah. That's, I think it's fascinating that somebody that's like has mental anguish and stuff like it requires in order to like take yourself out of that space. It requires things that take deep focus, like take skateboarding. You have to, you can't just be like, Oh, what am I going to have for lunch? As you're like trying to crook your grind at rail, you're like, you'll yeah. fucking die. Yeah. Like you got to be like really focused. Same with trying a hard trick on a snowboard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just cruising down the resort doesn't have that same effect. Cause you can be like, am I going to have a sandwich or am I going <laughs> to yeah, have yeah. uh bologna for lunch or what are we going to eat? Yeah. I don't know. I think that stuff's kind of fascinating. Well, we've been talking a lot about Jake. Let's just, uh, let's hit a little uh, guest question from none other. Then Jake Kuzik. Here we go. Hey guys, this is Jake Kuzik. Uh, Chris hit me up and asked me to come up with a question for Jed. Um, so I was thinking, Jed, do you have a favorite video part or maybe like a favorite trick or just something that you are really proud of that you've done over the last, uh, whatever it's been like 20 years or something now, but <laughs> I uh, I think people just watch your video parts and they they just think it's all like really easy for you or something and you're like barely trying. But I know that you like you put a lot of work into stuff and um, you really care how it looks and how it comes out. So I think it would just be interesting to hear kind of what's something that you're you're proud of and uh, you really you really felt turned out the way you were uh, excited to see it. So yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for the question, Jake. Um, I definitely have like a handful of tricks that I'm proud of. As far as like a, a whole project goes, like I don't think that I've made something like that I'm satisfied with yet. And maybe I won't ever. I think that's kind of typical though. Like 
maybe I was satisfied the day, the first day I watched it, and then I watch it, like, a couple more times, I'm like, uh, whatever, but tricks, shit, ones that stick out to me that, maybe the switchback lip on the triple kink, like, in Sweden, in Sweden, that, just that trick on that kind of rail at that time, I felt very, like, proud of myself for doing that. Backlit pretzel in Rhode Island. That We could talk about that, sorry, because that one's pretty funny, too. Yeah, yeah I was I was there. Was yeah, Chris was there fun. for that one. Were you there for the uh, switch backlit, too? No, I wasn't. Okay. I think, like, those two. And then more in more recent years, I don't know, like, it all kind of blends together, but like definitely in like my Adidas part, there is some, I like all those Japan clips and I think I, not one in particular. I just thought that that was like a really fun trip. Like we were with like Derek and I don't know, being in Japan is just so cool. So I, when I look back at those clips, it's just like, I have fond memories and um, it's not necessarily maybe the tricks, but. I don't know if that makes sense. Even, yeah. But I, I can watch it and it's like, gives me a good feeling and I'm like proud of it. And I'm just proud of that, how that trip went mm -hmm. and like hanging with Tommy and Derek and everyone Meyer and we had new year's there and like just lots of funny stories. So like when I watch that footage, it gives me like that good feeling. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the road, I feel like the Rhode Island clip is like a pretty funny one to talk about. Yeah. Let's get into it. Well, I don't know. Like I think I just wanted to backlip it. Like I, I backlip pretzel it on accident. <laughs> or, like, or like I mean I wasn't when I was dropping in I wasn't like I'm gonna backlit pretzel this but like when I hit the first kink I was like I think I can pretzel out right now <laughs> so like it just kind of happened I don't know I, I a lot of people ask me about that because like, I think it kind of looks accidental but I don't know I just think it's a funny story incredible and you hadn't really like gone off the end before that or no not even gotten particularly like that close, close yeah it just was a lock and then I just think it's funny, like, our, both of our reactions. I just love the, that. I really like that clip just for that. Like, I'm really psyched on, the, like, the trick and, like, the difficulty and, like, how it looked and everything. But I also, I don't know. Everyone was just, we were all just like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, you can hear me laughing yeah, hysterically yeah. in the background. I think I'm out. laughing, too. Yeah, I think Ollie's <laughs> also laughing. We're all just like, what the fuck? That was, like, that was, like, such a fluke. But, like, I guess I landed it, so. When you did that, I made a meme uh, I don't know if it's called a meme, whatever. Fucking old. <laughs> uh, it's kind of embarrassing. I don't know. Fossil, <laughs> but like just <laughs> fossil. A couple, couple of dinosaurs here, but I made an internet thing that um, it was a guy. It was uh from Goodwill Hunting, and uh, Matt Damon plays a character who can do math very easy, but he's a janitor for Harvard, and he solves the math problems on the wall while all the kids are at school. All the Harvard smart kids are. Or go in there. He's just the cust like the custodian that does it at night, and everybody's like, "Who solved these impossible math problems?" Ends up being Matt Damon. But at one point in that movie, he, um, the teacher, like wants him so badly to be this great math person, and he does this big math problem, and he's like, "Do you know how fucking easy this is for me? This is a fucking joke." <laughs> and I put that after Jed's backlit pretzel because that's how I felt like it, snowboarding was for him, and uh, the internet <laughs> loved it. We can we can dig that. The internet up. loved it. And, um, <laughs> Matt Damon. But yeah, Matt Damon. Was Affleck in that movie too? Uh, he might have a brief, brief part. I don't think he's a main character in that. I don't remember though. <laughs> I think that's a meme. We got another notable. Okay. The front flip when you're ac accidental front flip while filming, switch front flip. Yeah. Where you're riding and you clip the wall and you do a front flip and you land directly on your feet. Probably your most viral clip of all time. Dude, it's like, on there's like mad views on it and there's people arguing in the comments like this is clearly fake like oh they think it's fake <laughs> yeah then and people will say shit the camera pans all weird or something it's like clear this is clearly fake and then other people are like no it's not it's in this video blah 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 but yeah it's pretty funny to so is it fake or it's what? called like luckiest snowboarder alive i think <laughs> on youtube what yeah really? i think it has like over a hundred thousand views wow yeah viral it's a great name well, yeah, I was just trying to switch all the retaining wall and clipped. So it's not fake for the just to be not clear. Fake, yeah. For the listeners and viewers, it is real. We should get into your setup. I'm noticing it has no forward lean. You did the art yourself on the board. Uh, yeah. Let's hear a little bit about what you got going on. Okay. Yeah, this is the Ride Kink 151. 
um, kind of my board now, or like I do the graphic for it and everything. Um, I guess I could like flip it around too. That's sick. Yeah, this is next year's. But um, did the art and everything for it. I'm really psyched that they allowed me to take over this board. I remember watching uh, like Hebel and stuff ride the king. That's why I know that name. Huh? Hebel used to always yeah, Hebel had, ride. King. Hebel had like the sunset. Board. I remember that. Yeah, that board was really sick. And then, yeah, the bindings. I think these are the, yeah, that ride A6s. But I always take the forward lean Just off. pop those right off. I want to try to snowboard with forward lean. Like, I see, like, I was riding with Nick Baden, and I know, like, stacks, like, they all ride forward lean, and I'm sure it helps. But for me, it just feels so fucked up. Did you win the half pipe contest with no forward lean? I think so. I don't think I've ever, I think I've always kind of taken it off. It just feels like too crazy, but yeah, that's the that's the. Setup. What about your uh, stance with? Oh, and, stance and is about twenty inches, roughly, and I don't know the angles to be really? completely honest. You just whatever feels good feels good. The front foot's a little more that way, and the back foot's just a little <laughs> bit out. A little bit duck. Yeah, just a tiny bit duck. That's yeah. crazy. So when you set up a board, you don't know exactly what it is. Whatever looks right. Yeah. Is right. I'll measure the width. Like yeah, twenty inches. Between 19 and a half to 20 and a half, pretty much, always. Ballpark. When they got you out in the backcountry on this trip, did you pull it in the back seat a little bit? Yeah, like set, set back, I don't know, I was on a 57. Nice. Yeah. I was riding a 54 for a bit, and then couldn't land shit. Yeah, so. if you want to land, you got to <laughs> scale up a little so bit. So I had to scale up, yeah. But, no, super fun. That board looks dope. Thank you. 2022, that's what we're saying. I think so. That's Shit, sick. I should probably know that. No, I'm sure. <laughs> he's sure a, he's like pretending to be tech guy. I see this dude. He takes shit out of the plastic, straps his bindings on. Doesn't know what the fuck's what going on. What about detune? Any edge detune? Slight, slight. Not fully round. I used to definitely go fully round, but I like to have a little bit of an edge now. Yeah. Soft dogger. That's the. Soft Is it soft? Dog. It's not that soft. The kink. A little soft. Give oh. it a flex, dude. I, yeah, I feel like uh, well, I'll give this thing flex. a little pop. See what's really I don't like on. a super soft board. I always thought the kink board was soft. Oh, dude, this thing is soft. Oh, dude, that is a. But it's got. It's actually has. It's soft, but it, right there, it has a little. Eh? Little kickback. Eh? Dude, know. Ride knows what they they're doing. They've been making boards a long ass time. Yeah. I mean, the kink alone. Is, yeah, it's an old. It's yeah, like I remember Hebel riding that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's been around a long time. Another subject that's a common thing um, on IG. You know, IG, Instagram, a lot of people spend a lot of time staring at their phone. You don't do a lot of uh, self-promotion on there. We notice pretty common for the old boarders to uh, self-promote. I want to look up Luckiest. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> We need to throw that bit up. Oh, yeah. It's a classic. <laughs> luckiest Snowboard Alive. That's I think one. that's what it's called. Yeah. Last yeah. time I fucking looked it up. So what's up with the gram? How come uh, How come you don't uh, whore yourself out and <laughs> self-promote like <laughs> the average person in that gets paid to board does? I think think a part of it is that I'm lucky enough to have a my con I don't have that shit in my contracts or I haven't yet which is pretty cool um and I don't know maybe I'm I just I don't like seeing that shit so I just want to I just post shit that I would like to see or that I think is interesting that's pretty much it and I also, uh, yeah, I don't know. I get annoyed when people just constantly posting about themselves. That's just me, though. But, like, yeah, that's there's not too much to it. No, I, I love just, it. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I um, don't know. I just, like, I don't want to. I, like, get self-conscious sometimes, too, posting, like, sh- if I'm like, oh, I just, po- I don't want to post two things in a row of myself or something. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know. No, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And I just, like, I like, like, growing up, I didn't know shit about any of my favorite snowboarders. And... I don't really want to, unless I meet them, then that I want to. Like, if we have a relationship, that's cool. But I don't really, like, want to know everything about these people. The misty factors, you want, that's, that's definitely real. You want, like, you're more, you're almost more interested when you don't know. Like, yeah, and that? it's not, it's not something I'm doing on, per, I'm not, like, going to be like, oh, I want to be, like, this mysterious, like, <laughs> fucking dude you're that not no one knows anything. I'm just, like... I'm just gonna post like what I. Well, I gotta I gotta ask cool. another question because as a as a dude that is like out of touch with a lot of things, right? Like I, 
I don't know. I don't know about like a lot of the scenes. Like I'm looking at. I was like looking at Graham the other day. I'm looking. There's like a picture. Of, like let's just take example. Like a brick wall. I'm like, what? I'm just like, what? What am I looking at here? Who is posting a picture of a brick wall? I don't, I don't know. know. Like, pictures of brick walls. What? <laughs> There's no pictures of brick walls. It was. So, I swear to God, it was like just a wall. Maybe I don't know. I'd have to see the photo, I guess. But I guess a lot of it, I look at. It. I don't know. Like a lot of, just like composition or colors. Okay. Uh, yeah, some people I, I, are looking at lines. I'm pretty like I'm pretty. I, I really like artists. photography too. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah, it's not. There's like different thing. I don't know. Just I just if it looks interesting, I don't know. I like, like that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. It looks interesting to you because I'm looking. I'm like, what the fuck am I looking at here? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I'm a, a little wall. bit more hollow headed in that sense yeah, where yeah. I'm like, you know, um, but but uh, I love it. I love that it's explained. It's like a little uh, little Mythbusters going on here kind of situation where we're figuring things out. Keep it coming. <laughs> what um, else do you want to know? Oh, dude, I just remembered this. <laughs> what else do you want to know? <laughs> uh, what about back in the day? Fuck, when was it? I don't know how long ago it was. I remember some shit on the internet of you posting a photo with some dude, and uh, people freaked out. True. Uh, me kissing my, my homie. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my friend Ben Blundell. You can give him a Let's give him an air, air horn. horn. I'm glad you brought that up because people. No oh, time out. My ear, I'm on the wrong air horn thing. I'm soul. getting floppy over here. Let me go back. <laughs> All right, we got to let's give them there. Is it horn. five o'clock or something? Yeah, we're fading. <laughs> <laughs> At five o'clock, I start shutting three, down. Doc. All right, we got the air horn. We're good. We're back. So, your homie Ben. Yeah, I don't know. It was just Halloween. And then I think we were just like a bit faded and we we're like, let's, we should just post a photo of us kissing or something. I don't even fucking know. It was just like, fu- like we we're just like fucking around. I don't know. And then people freaked out. People just lost it. Yeah. Dude, it was like the response was fucked up. Dude, it was crazy. And then. I didn't think of anything posting it. I just thought it was like, I don't know. He's one of my best friends. Was, and I kind of like, I was like, I wonder, it was kind of an experiment almost. I'd be like, I wonder how, like, who's going to like expose themselves and being like fucking whack people. So there's a lot of haters. Oh yeah. There's, I got like crazy, like hate mail and shit. You lost wow. a bunch of followers. I too. lost like over a hundred followers. Like, wow. How all, long ago was this? Probably like four years ago. Well, it's it funny. Like you did it ago. now. It's like anyone who did that would be taken out, out and, and, shut down themselves and dude and everyone would give you nothing but positivity i mean there's still people out there like that though for but sure they wouldn't they would hide themselves now yeah. probably you know just interesting that is a good experiment yeah but yeah it was just and then there was like articles and shit like i was just like whoa this is crazy i didn't really like um, what like uh snowboard articles I, yeah yeah like i think like yo beat or something oh uh, okay just like i don't know some weird shit I didn't think of anything of it. I think we were just like kind of faded and like posted and then like woke up in the morning. I was like, oh my God. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. It's crazy to see when people show their ugliest. Like, I used to fuck with you, but now I don't because of this. Like, really? Dude, yeah. I got mad. I got mad shit like that. And I even hearing people just talking around town, they're like, they'd be like, that's, you know, say some crazy shit. You're like, dude, really? Like, that's affecting your life that much? Who gives a shit? So funny. Kind of like green jacket, gold jacket. Who gives the shit? Mm-hmm. One other story I want to bring up while we while we got the uh, time is when we were uh, we were in Sauce Fay. I got airlifted out because I tried to back seven this thing, and I did this like penciled out back seven, laid on my back, couldn't move my legs, and I was like pretty fucked up. And I remember shortly after you were making fun of me on the trampoline, <laughs> doing these spinning flips. <laughs> Completely locked body being like, hey, I'm Chris. <laughs> and you had to get airlifted? That was a Solomon trip. Huh? I remember hearing about that. Jed is incredibly good at roasting the homies when he needs to. Yeah, sorry about that. That was pretty fucked up. Were you still at the hospital or what? <laughs> no, I think he was. No, this is back. No, I was. I actually could walk around shortly oh, after. Okay. I, it was like weird, like my back seat. Yeah, up. weird, like Seize freak up. out. Yeah. I think Curtis, I was just like Curtis roasting him, like uh, noticing. I was just like being like, it wasn't even that serious and just kind of trying to roast him. Yeah. I'm like, you're walking around. <laughs> No, it wasn't that serious. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, at the time, I couldn't. I just couldn't move for a second there. But that's super sketchy. Yeah, you've you've got a pretty good skill at uh, roasting the homies. I've seen you, and you wanna you wanna get somebody. You're pretty good at. I'm decent at it. Decent roaster. <laughs> Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers roasters chicken. One other thing I just want to jump back into before we get out that just sparked into my brain with with talking to Jake. He was kind of saying that. Now that you've been doing it for however many, 12, 
plus video parts and you're you're building this kind of like catalog of work do you feel like you're as you as you keep progressing and evolving you're kind of like overviewing your whole catalog and and trying to build on that now i don't know that was something he he was kind of expressing what do you mean like as far as how to better yeah how to, how to better your your whole um overview of your career you could say like how to refine it yeah no way. do i think about that yeah yeah definitely like i think about like i look at some of my old video parts and i cringe <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like oh like that clip's disgusting or like that i was wearing some like whack shit or whatever but it's also cool is like a time little time capsule to look back on but yeah no i definitely do i i think every year that i move on and i decide to make a commitment towards filming for a project it's like how can i come out of this with a product that i'm going to be happy with and something that is almost like maybe more mature i don't know if that's the right word but just something that's that makes sense it's like a building block Mm -hmm. and like how can i diversify what i've already done or how can i how can i continue to keep this interesting for myself and for people watching it and yeah, I definitely think about all of that. It reminds me of like a band that's been going for a long time and like led, like Led Zeppelin, you know, and it's like <laughs> it, whatever, maybe that's a shitty example, but they, the body of work over time, like you see it evolve and change and it's all good. But like that whole, the fucking latex mansion greatest hits album is going to be a of. slapper, <laughs> you know? I so. look, yeah. And like, I think someone like Ave is like a prime example of at he, all his footage is always amazing and he's like a he's like 45 or something you know and he's still putting out like amazing footage but it's di- it's not necess- it's different but that's like so motivating cuz i'm like i have if i if he's doing like that like you can do it for a, a minute and i don't know that i am super inspired by people like that mm mm-hmm. Yeah, people want to put an expiration date on your career, and oh, he's this old. Well, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna revolving door, just get out with the old and with the new. And there's there's you know, we don't know what the the ceiling is. Like a lot more people are looking yeah. forward to an Ave part than the local nine year old that can hard flip the stairs that nobody's heard of. Like, Dude, I, I, you know. And I think we get myself included. Like we get stuck of watching. We're basing our reality off of what has been done, but it's like, I don't know. I, it's exciting to think you could, there that that isn't really a, a real thing. Like, people didn't think Ava was going to be filming, like, these parts. People would be like, no, that's impossible. But, I don't know, it's cool just to think, of, like, how far can you push it? Mm-hmm. Like as long as your body and exactly your drive, and it. Your, as long as your body and your drive are still there, mm-hmm. you just got to stay healthy and mentally focused on the drive. Yeah. Well, what's next for uh, Latex Match? <laughs> Been working on this project with Jake Kennedy and Hayden Wrench. Shout out to Hayden and Kennedy for sure. Um, that's going to be coming out in the fall. Just a, a video. We worked on it this year. Kind of a, obviously a weird year for it with traveling and everything, but I think Hayden's so talented, like he'll make something awesome. And I'm excited to see what what happens with it. And then other than that, yeah, I just been working on this Adidas clip as well out here, trying to get some clips for that. Um, and then after this, yeah, I don't know, go back to Canada and quarantine for two weeks, I guess. Is that what you got to do when you go home? Yeah. So Quentin Quarantino. Yeah, was it a nightmare to get into the states? It was pretty chill. Like, um, you just had to make sure all your ducks were in a row, um, have the right COVID test, and have all the info your return flight and where you're staying, who you're staying with, all their contact info. Like, it was super weird because you're used to going through customs, and there's so many people everywhere. It was me and one other guy. Oh wow! It was just su- and and Toronto is a big airport. You yeah, know? so it was just it felt very dystopian and. Kind of like some weird sci-fi movie. Do they have the vaccine shot available in Canada? I don't know. I know, like, here, anyone can get it now. Deadline got it at Smith's yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, shit, anyone can just roll in. That's wild. Roll in, maybe not him being a Canadian, but 
One more topic uh, that we didn't talk about at all, and maybe that was on purpose. How come you used to rock a helmet, and all of a sudden you switched and got away from it? You made it look good back in the day. I don't know. Um, I think that I just, I don't know why I used to. Just, say, yeah, safety, safety thing, obviously, and... Um, I don't know if it was because you were younger and maybe your and mom I, was like, and I was, I was, young, I, I was just younger too. Yeah. And definitely just grew up wearing one. And I think there was definitely like a fear of taking it off and hitting my head. And, and I still think helmets are cool. Like, and I think that it's fine. It's just, I have no other reason than aesthetically that I just don't like how my footage looks as much, which is stupid. But yeah. Cause you rocked it for so many years, right? Like how yeah. long? I have no idea. Quite a while. Though. Long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have any. Excuse- I heard the helmet excuses. community was sad that that you stopped embracing it. It's not even that I don't embrace it. Like I still embrace it. I think it's sick if people wear it. Like I have no. Yeah, issues. just like for myself, it's just like personal. I decided not to wear it for right now, but maybe I'll go back to it one of these days. Like I have nothing against it. Yeah, but before we leave this booth, I noticed it's raining outside, and uh, but it's been a mild winter here in Utah. What does that mean? <laughs> it has been a mild winter. What that means for Salt Lake is there's going to be an uptick in the rat population. And uh, my dog, Uno, killed a rat the other day, actually, which was pretty tight because we have a serious problem in, in Cottonwood yeah, Ice. Uno. Big problem. Yeah, Uno snapped U- its neck. Big Uno. shout out to Uno. Big, big Uno. shout out. You had the crazy air horn for Uno. <laughs> oh, yeah, you doing Uno. super air horn? Yeah. <laughs> for Uno. Yeah, Uno. <laughs> <laughs> Snap that rat's neck. Wow, Uno, super air horn. Yeah, but be on the lookout for an uh, uptick in the rat population. It's a serious thing in Salt Lake. I heard uh, you got to make sure you dispose of your dog shit correctly because they like to eat that. True. You want to stay up on that? Another issue in my neighborhood, the neighbors, they try to poison the rats. Really? And uh, it's been killing other people's dogs. Yeah, that's so sketchy, yeah. I feel like. So there's been a big, big thing put out in Cottonwood about, or all over Salt Lake, just about not poisoning the rats with that nasty stuff. Also kills the owls that are around. Wow. Big issue. OVO. You don't want to be killing those out. Yeah. But dude, I, I, I work uh, I work with my laptop on my my uh, kitchen table sometimes. And these little rats, I just see them walk no. past my doorway. Not in the house. Okay. I'm like right by the doorway. And I just see this little bat. Scurry? A little scurry? Well, he's not. He like pimp walk past. He's not even scared. Really? But now hopefully that Uno killed one. So those guys are bred for that? Yeah. French bulldogs were, were bred in Paris to kill... Kill down the rat population. God damn it, that's informative. Yeah. So if you have a rat problem, get a French bulldog. Okay, noted. Before we get out of here, Latex, you want to hit us with a couple thank yous? Yeah, I just first and foremost want to thank my family, um, my mom and dad. I love you guys very much. Super air horn. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, my brother and his wife, Bree, and my niece and nephew. I love you guys very much. Uh, my girlfriend Leah, love you very much. Love all my friends very much. Thanks. I'm just super grateful to have so many uh, awesome people in my life that care about me, and I care about them a lot too. Um, other than that, as far as snowboarding goes, I just want to say thank you to all the sponsors that have been helping or who have helped me out throughout my career: Air Blaster, Burton Farm, uh, Nike, and then of course my current sponsors. Ride and Adidas, I couldn't be happier to be with you guys. Super air horn for both of those. <laughs> yeah. Chris Excuse is me. working that, yeah. that thing. Gunshot, super air horn. Woo! I feel like yeah. DJ Matty Mo. Yeah. And I don't know. I feel like, yeah, the whole Solomon years were, like, so formative for both of us. And Hava and Lou, like, those dudes, like, really, I don't know. Helped me out a lot. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that's, it's I, like you said, you can't name everyone, but if I forgot you and I don't know, you know, if I fuck with you and I care about you, <laughs> I hope. Well, Jed, I say thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, the whole goddamn snowboarding community and anybody that knows you, you've had a huge, I don't think you realize how big your impact has been on um, a generation of people. So, it's been an honor to sit down and chat with you. And, uh, man, wish you success and can't wait to keep watching what you do every year in, year out. And uh, thank, thank goodness you're back, man. We're oh, stoked. Th- thanks so much we for having you. me. 
No, the podcast, I listen to it. It's awesome. Hell yeah. You guys are doing some good shit. That's sick. That makes us happy to hear. Warms the heart. And uh, we want to thank you guys for listening, watching, tuning in every week. We will see you guys next week over and out from the bomb hole.